Modern Warfare Zombies, a title often thrown around for a project helmed in the Modern Warfare universe, a fantasy that pits the likes of Task Force 141 against the undead threat in the same vein of Cold War, which reintroduces zombies to the Black Ops characters and universe. A game that was even in the early stages of development for Modern Warfare 2019's reboot, with some early concept art being found too. But with the current Call of Duty model of crossing over each of their games and universes into a shared narrative, it was only a matter of time before the hordes of the undead and the Dark Aether reached these characters, and such in a totally not desperate bid to get people like me to buy Modern Warfare 3, MWZ was born, an extraction looter shooter that attempts to shake up the formula once again, pulling elements from Warzone, DMZ, round-based zombies, and even Outbreak. MWZ is a surprising take on the zombies formula, which I think actually works. Oh boy, this is going to be a mess to review. Well, hello there fellow zombie slayers, my name is Stanley557, and welcome back to the review series where we continue to ignore core entries in favor of the ones no one else will talk about. To preface, MWZ is a game I'm quite contentious on. I really enjoy many of its aspects, but for every feature it gets right, two are either undercooked or abandoned. But what exactly is MWZ? How does this mode play differently than what we're used to? And how does any of this fit into the current narrative? Well, ladies and gentlemen, strap yourselves in as we dive into the world of Modern Warfare Zombies, abandoned by Activision. Today, for MWZ, we're going to be reviewing this game differently. Instead of going over each aspect of the game in a large overview of the year, let's talk about how it evolved, sectioning each topic by season. So for part one, we're going to be going over the game's launch and subsequent first few weeks of release in a large overview. This review is also going to miss many specifics, but the primary purpose of this video is to document what the game is, what content it had going for it, and how it evolved and stagnated over the year of its release. So let's begin. For those of you who decided to skip this game, and rightfully so, let's talk about what MWZ is and the drastic changes it makes to the Zombies formula. But first, where are we at in the story? Coming 35 years after the defeat of the Forsaken, Victor Zakayev from the MW campaign returns in the hopes of using Ethereum for his own pursuits of taking over the West. Retrieving some distilled Ethereum from the hidden remains of the Requiem heads like Grigori Weaver, Zakayev is forced to use this substance against American forces that are attempting to capture him. And in the ensuing chaos, a 35-year-old arms race is reborn, and Urzikstan is transformed into an undead battlefield. Now recruited by the CIA, Sergei Ravanov from the Cold War leads operators through the battlefield under the guise of Operation Deadbolt, a program meant to capture Zakayev and defeat the many monsters that roam the wasteland, keeping much of the same consistency and world-building from Cold War and Vanguard. For example, undead are unable to reach too far outside the containment zone, but with the infection spreading, it must be stopped before it's too late. And with the strike team having to combat not only monsters, but hired gun known as Terminus Outcomes, the fight has only gotten more difficult. This setup is alright, and I have mixed feelings about it. Sure, it's cool to see Ravanov, especially after his Cold War campaign bundle was cancelled due to the Ukrainian war. But the narrative's antagonist is nothing more than a rehashed campaign villain, and one who is essentially brought back to life in order for there to be a villain people recognize but one they can do whatever they want with as they're technically dead because, you know, when you fall down the missile silo, you, I, I don't know, die? This is kind of like what they did with Kravchenko, but infinitely less interesting, as Zakayev does practically nothing in terms of the game's narrative, and is more of a setup villain that pushes the story into motion, but a threat is as an active as Monty in the Aether storyline. Now, if there's anything I love about this setup, it's the intro cutscene, and its cinematic flair and direction. Taking the best aspects of the gritty FPS world and the fantastical nature of zombies, this cutscene seamlessly blends the two styles together, with the shot of the Ethereum canister breaking being marvelous, and the subsequent round change theme being super chilling. with the cutscene better reflecting movies like World War Z in terms of how the undead interact, but one that still fits into the world of COD Zombies. 
It's a batch of details, but they all go a long way, especially with trying to introduce this new universe to the Modern Warfare world. I also love how the smoke looks like hands as it consumes and kills people. Oddly similar to how Prima Materia reacted in Chaos, and also how we see Samantha attack people in the Liberty Falls intro. But that's our overall narrative. Bare bones, yet saved by the details Treyarch is known for. So from that, let's get into all the gameplay changes. MWZ's main gameplay loop is segmented into one-hour play sessions. You load into the map, get as much done as possible towards your current objectives, and then exfil when the time is right, or when the spreading Ethereum storm forces you out of the map like Fortnite. During this time, you can collect and complete contracts, loot the area for extra goodies, and complete objectives such as story missions or the numerous Dark Aether rips that appear later in the game's lifespan. The contracts are a reworked version of the many main and side objectives from Outbreak and Vanguard's two objective-based experiences. Each of these tasks are placed on your map at all times, and by beginning and completing a contract, you'll be rewarded with points and a reward rift which can grant you many useful but randomly selected items. These rewards range from perks, to equipment, to even on occasion, wonder weapons like the Ray Gun and Wonder Waff. These contracts are short and simple and are meant to be repeated at nauseam, an infinitely improved system over Outbreak. And while good intentioned in Outbreak, MWZ better creates the nuance of playing at your own pace by streamlining the way contracts work, having both ones placed on your map and those you'll simply stumble upon naturally in gameplay. With the contract solely regenerating over time, you're given an infinite amount of options on how you choose to actually play the game, whereas Outbreak requires you to complete the main objective if you wish to progress, and the side objectives are also required if you actually want the funds to remain powerful. Operation Deadbolt does away with all this meandering. Okay, well, it has some, but nowhere even close to the level of emptiness that Outbreak had. MWZ is clearly curated to correct these missteps in Outbreak's design, and I think that these improvements are what immediately sets it apart from that mode improving in many areas while hosting its own festering issues, but we'll get into those as we go on. The main objectives are split into eight distinct contracts, some returning from Outbreak while others are wholly unique. These include defending a safe while you drill for free weapons, defeating an elite enemy, escort an Ethereum tank and seal various breaches, defeat Terminus threats and prevent them from drilling Ethereum, cleanse and purge an area of Ethereum spores, collect Dark Aether data and survive until it completes, deliver cargo to the exfil point, and defend radio supplies from Terminus forces. The one you'll never do because it sucks. Then there's the side objectives, which can be started, completed, or abandoned at any time. These objectives don't grant you a reward rift, but a random selection of predetermined loot and are meant to be encountered naturally in gameplay rather than sought out, which gives the mode some spontaneity, even if I don't actually think it's worth to go for any of these. There's spore nests to clear out, which give you alternate ammo types, Terminus outcome encounters, which can evolve from camps, to compounds, to strongholds with a Terminus Warlord, there's the Ethereum Orb back from Outbreak, mercenary convoys, ambush spawns, and other side objectives like activating the Greylorm boss fight introduced in Season 1, but we'll get to that later. Each of these objectives and contracts, besides the radio one, are quick and easy to do, but lack the meat that makes them engaging. They're meant to be repeated hundreds of times, and by that design, they're oftentimes shallow and uninteresting, featuring quick sporadic bursts of combat that last no more than 2-3 minutes. These events are the meat and potatoes of how you progress, and while there are other means of progression, these are the most obvious and direct. The first couple of times you complete these events, they're great, but when you're going for the game's endgame content, the objectives become nothing more than white noise, with the only redeeming quality being the dopamine from the reward rift, which becomes null and void once you essentially spawn in completely kitted out. And sadly, I felt this way after about a month or so of playing the game, but I digress. Some of the rewards that you receive can be exfilled out of the game, like perks, Ethereum crystals, Ethereum wrenches, and alternate ammo type mods. If you successfully exfil, you keep that item in your post-game inventory, and when you load into another game MWZ, you'll have the option to equip said item and make your neck experience a little bit easier. This ebb and flow is how you make overall long-term progress in MWZ. 5 steps forward, 4.75 steps back kind of deal. And in the endgame, you're essentially required to equip from the get-go the best gear in order to stand a chance against the late-game enemies like Greylorm or the numerous Dark Aether Rifts later introduced in the game. But there are some items that are nearly impossible to exfil with, like an Ethereum Crystal that instantly makes your weapon Tier 3, or an Orange Aether Tool that gives your weapon the highest tier of damage. Well, that's where the schematic system comes in play. Depending on the circumstance, whether it be through story progression, Dark Aether Rifts, or standard gameplay, you'll come across a schematic. 
If you successfully exfil with the schematic, you'll unlock the ability to permanently craft one of these items in your out of game menu. When crafted, you can load into a game of MWZ with this item. For example, during the story, you can unlock the Quick Revive schematic. In an out of game menu, you can now craft a can of Quick Revive. With that said, you are now guaranteed to have one time access to Quick Revive instead of needing to loot it from reward rifts or travel across the map and hunt down the machine. On a side note, let's talk about exfilling, because I totally didn't forget to include it and talk about it in the first draft and had nowhere else to put it. As players progress through a game with MWZ, multiple exfil points will become available. It's up to the player to choose whether or not they want to leave and call in an exfil. Usually you're given the freedom to do this on your own time, but once the storm comes in, it's either do or die. Exfilling in MWZ had been rebranded from its inclusion in Cold War and Vanguard. This time around, there is no kill requirement. Instead, players are tasked with simply surviving and boarding the plane when ready. Now granted, you can simply leave, but where's the fun in that? This exfil system spawns in hordes of the undead. What might seem trivial at first does promote people to actually utilize this time to complete camo challenges. And at the game's launch, it wasn't uncommon for people to call in an exfil and simply use that to work towards the game's mastery camo, Borealis. Exfilling at specific locations is also how you access the act missions, but we'll talk about those later. I'm still contentious on this feature, but I feel the lack of a round-based framework makes the system flow better and the endless undead work in this scenario unlike how they do in exfilling in Cold War, as you fight for your survival and escape. Once the storm comes through, a final exfil will appear at the opposite side of the map from the storm. This does create some intense moments if you're completely unprepared. As the storm is moving through, fast travels are disabled, and exfil points will also be disabled as well. And while in the storm, you will take damage unless you use a gas mask, which will inevitably be destroyed, leading to you taking it down. All of these systems in tandem create the main gameplay loop of MWZ. Load into a match, collect and complete contracts, earn rewards, exfil, and reload in with said rewards in an attempt to make it farther than last time. If anything, it is kind of zombies at its core. But if at any point in this process you fail to exfil or you're killed in combat, you must reset your progress. You can be set back even more if you don't have any schematics or backup rewards in your inventory. Personally, this whole system is semi-redundant, and feels like an excuse to keep you playing because, for the most part, 80% of MWZ's gameplay is a one-and-done deal. You've done it once, you've done it all, which was an issue I ran into Cold War with during its life cycle. And if you ask me, this progression system is extremely punishing to new players, forcing you to work through an uphill battle, with the possibility that all of your progress could be for nothing should you fail. Real Sisyphus Syndrome. So this is probably where the DMZ aspect came in during development, and explains the gameplay loop being restricted to an hour, as in that time, with an empty account, you're only able to obtain a tier 2 or 3 blue tier weapon. That loop can be somewhat boring, especially when you're working towards the game's long-term goals, as there will be games where it feels like you've hardly made any progress. And losing a game with MWZ can be mind-numbing, because unlike perks, crystals, and wrenches, which can be created by a late game player, Items like your backpack and armor, which grant you more slots in game and damage reduction respectively, can only be retrieved in map, which makes you waste about 20 minutes of your time doing what is essentially set up for both the current game and another game down the line, assuming you don't go down. And when you're just starting out in MWZ, every game can feel like a setup game for the next, and that sadly adds to the tedium of the whole process. And as stated previously, this is further compounded with some games making you feel like you end up just spinning your wheels and making no progress towards completing the main campaign. But this might simply be criticisms of the looter-shooter extraction system as a whole, rather than a fall of MWZ in general. Because if you ask me, if there was no time limit, I'd say you could realistically experience everything the map has to offer in no less than 5-6 to six hours across 2-3 to three games, with this being extended to 6-8 to eight hours at max if you go into the Dark Aether Rift and the Greylorn fight. But due to the one hour time limit, you're forced to return and recomplete the same setup process every single time you want to progress forward. For example, let's say you hardly have any useful schematics and you want to complete some objectives in tier 3 and you and your squad are loaded in with practically nothing. Well, you'll need to load in, collect your perks, get your weapons papped, obtain a higher rarity weapon from a tier 3 wall buy, as high tier rarity weapons are near impossible to guarantee or get super lucky with a reward rift, and then enter tier 3, upgrade that new weapon, and begin your conquest. And at this point, you've taken up about 25 to 35 minutes of your 1 hour time slot. And only in this last half hour can you make any progress, with there being even less time if you want to safely exfil and avoid the storm. Now sure, there is the argument that every game varies based on how you approach and complete your setup. 
Maybe one game you choose to load in with a rocket launcher, and then early on switch from that to an AR wall buy or a shotgun that you found in tier 3. But due to the limited amount of time, there's only so many options and choices you can make before it becomes somewhat fruitless to do so, and it's best to stick with the best thing that you've got. Especially due to the way that attachments are randomized like they were initially in Cold War, with your best and most customizable weapon being the one that you load it in with. But to back up the previous statement and counter it, most people who play this game are casual fans who enjoy this setup process and won't progress anywhere close to the endgame content, which is totally fair. This is simply my analysis of the gameplay loop of MWZ, how the timer affects the means of play, and how I feel it limits itself purposely in order to force you to play longer and more subsequent games. If this were, say, a normal zombies mode, then you spend the first 30 minutes getting set up. From there, you have however long that you want to experiment and explore. But as stated previously, in MWZ's case, the fun feels like it's over just when it's getting started. And personally, this could be remedied by simply extending the timer another hour. But then you'd be able to complete everything that the game has to offer too quickly like Cold War. A flaw in the game's design that inherently affects everything. So from the main gameplay loop, let's talk about how the game presents all of these various features to you. First off, through the map. Totally taking inspiration from Warzone and Outbreak, and totally not being forced to use a Warzone map and make it work in a zombies mode, because Activision Resource System Time Management is a joke, Urzikstan is a massive sprawling landscape split into three distinct zones and difficulties. Zone 1 is the most clear, and it's where most players get started, featuring the easiest objectives and the smallest rewards, with the lowest chance of obtaining good loot. You might encounter a single Mangler, Bargua, or even a few Hellhounds. This zone is the biggest with the most amount of play space between objectives, making the gameplay slow but complements the game's vehicles the best. Zone 2 is directed by Michael Bay and features a plethora of challenges close together, especially in the city towards the south of the map. Here you'll encounter Barguas, Manglers, Hellhounds, and Disciples roaming the battlefield alongside being in objectives. This is the best spot to play and as the enemies are just easy enough to deal with but aren't exactly pushovers either. And if Tier 3 becomes too full, this is probably the next best option. And finally, there's the aforementioned Tier 3, which is painted a hyper-realistic blood red, and features the toughest, fastest, and overall most annoying enemy AI to encounter. But the challenges and contracts are the closest together, providing you with the quickest gameplay loop and the highest tier reward. Of course, they're also the most difficult and risky to complete, and if you go down, there's a low chance you'll be able to make it out alive. Tier 3 also reintroduces the Abomination from Forsaken into the fray, and after playing around with this thing for over a year, it's comical how much smaller the normal abomination is in comparison. This zone was designed as the end game for players, but as the game has gone on, this is where most players are both bottlenecked in terms of progression, so you'll most likely see everyone huddled up here at this point. Which, that does lead to other issues with the zone being too full, you're constantly competing with other players for schematics and contracts, it's a bit of a mess. This system works quite well, and while I wish the difficulty spike between 2 and 3 wasn't so high, this progression aids in corralling players at different skill levels to the proper zone naturally, with the big jumps in difficulty meant to naturally deter weaker players, and it is done in such a way that upgrading your weapons is just as useful as having the skill to survive. For example, Tier 3 is the game's most difficult zone. A good player can survive using just a blue tier weapon. Whereas on the flip side, a bad player will still be defeated even if they're using a gold tier PAP 3-1. This important distinction is what makes progression in MWZ satisfying, despite my criticisms of how it affects the one-hour gameplay loop. Personally, Tier 3 ticked me off around the game's launch. Mainly the Hellhounds of Tier 3, but as you progress through the game, you'll acquire the tools and experience that makes the game much more fun. And I have to give the developers credit, they did introduce a difficult zone in zombies that couldn't just be pushed around by training in circles. The beauty of tier 3 is its chaos inherent nature, and the area demands skill above all else, which I can commend. So now that we know what the game is all about, and how the map works, how does it fill up the play space? Well, let's talk about the player count first. MWZ features a 24 player, cooperative lobby. Loading into a game of Operation Deadbolt will see you and 23 other players work together and compete with one another to complete contracts and work towards objectives. At the game's launch, it was only possible to squad up with players, so if you get stuck in a squad completing challenges that aren't to your liking, there wasn't much you could do. Thankfully, there is a solo infill option, but this game is NOT intended to be played solo, at least at its launch. And much of its difficulty is balanced around being in a squad or teaming up with other players around the battlefield. There's even a global game chat which can be used to squad up with and locate other people, which I think is really cool. 
One of the most fun things in this game mode is checking the chat and locating players who have bled out and need to be revived so that they can exfil with what they have. It also helps you can revive people of any squad, spurring spontaneous teamwork should you be nearby when another squad needs help, which the game denotes to you if you're near a down player. This effect works best in Tier 3, where you are most likely to be the closest to one another, so the chat helps should you bleed out in Tier 1 with no one but the undead around you to keep you company. Moments like these are some of the best in the mode, and proves a greater than 4 player experience could truly work for zombies. For example, the schematic system incentivizes that you work in squads. As you complete objectives, you have a small chance to earn a schematic from reward rifts, and the more players you have in your squad, the greater the chance that you have to receive them, like a tombstone schematic in Tier 3. And what's cool is that if one player earns a schematic, everyone earns it, further incentivizing teamwork. But let's say you already have the jug schematic. Well, you can tell people in the global chat to meet up with you on the map, and you can give away your schematics to someone for free. This is what made the mode so much fun at its launch. Being able to run around and attempt to earn these coveted items, or attempt to beat other players to the meetup point, made the experience like nothing zombies had ever seen before. At launch, people would post online about duplicate schematics that they found, how they got the Jug and Reagan schematic on their first game, or horror stories of people going back and forth into games trying to earn the schematics for themselves. It was genuinely a really cool moment for the community, and props to the developers for giving players cool, intangible rewards that actually fit cohesively into the game's natural design. It's also a cool status symbol too, but it's something as easy as completing an objective, which anyone can realistically do. It's really just all about your dedication and luck. You can get it on the first try, and the 100th try, but due to the communication system between players, and the extra chances being a squad gives you, there are workarounds to mitigate the RNG should you seek them out. It's easily my favorite part of the whole experience, and I would love to see this idea of low chance rewards and zombies return in some way, shape, or form. It provides so much life to the game's launch. So you have all these player bonuses and systems, but what about the enemies? MWZ is the second experience to introduce both undead and human AI threats. The first being the Atlas Strike Team from Carrier. Both groups of enemies want you dead, with there being some overlap between the two. But first, let's go over the monsters. Across its three regions, MWZ sports the return of the Bargua, the Mangler, and the Disciple from Cold War, with each playing nearly identical to their respective counterparts. Then there's the returning Napalm Hounds from Firebase C, and Outbreak, which I swear to god if I see these things one more time, I'm going to scream. And finally, there's the souped up version of the Abomination known as the Mega Abomination. These monsters patrol the highest threat zone of the game, and do what most Abominations do, run at players and shoot lightning out of their mouths. Due to their massive size, these creatures present a much greater presence on the battlefield, and it is extremely difficult to escape them once they have your scent. Abominations in MWZ are all about confidence and teamwork, whereas in Cold War, the beast is more akin to a bull. And just like every other enemy type, Abominations now produce a long-ranged attack that can hit players even if they're out of bounds. The Mega Abominations' ranged ability is to produce small Nova crawler like beings that chase you should you bunker down in an area it can't access. These nest crawlers explode upon reaching the player, and deal true electrical damage that pierces through your armor. All in all, this enemy variety consists of primarily heavy threats that the game likes to throw at you in droves, and the Mega Abomination is a nice challenge that perfectly mixes up the gameplay should he get involved in one of your challenges like the Escort. On the other hand, Manglers, Barguas, and Disciples have become exhaustive secondary enemies that feel completely devoid of any presence that they once had, especially in Tier 3, where the game likes to throw them at you like candy, and especially in the Aether Rifts, when it starts getting sickening and tired how many of these guys I have to see. In the final Aether Rift and then the Unstable Rift, is this enough? Is there enough Mimics, Manglers, and Disciples that I have to deal with? Have we not exhausted this enemy type yet? Anywho, then there's the Mercenary enemies, which more or less have their own dedicated encounters and events. When initially revealed, this was an enemy type I was most worried about them implementing into the game, and in retrospect, I don't feel they were handled the best, especially at launch. Around that time, these enemies dealt way too much damage, and could pretty much down players in mere moments, especially if they got the upper hand on you. At best, you're able to take them out before they take you out. At worst, you get sidelined by a merc you couldn't see coming. These enemies felt incredibly unbalanced, and it didn't help that there weren't too many counters to them besides using the RGL grenade launcher or spamming the armor refill button every 3 seconds. 
Can't fire back if your guts are splattered everywhere, I suppose. There's a ton of variants of these guys, so bear with me as we cover them all. There's the grunts, soldiers, and elites as your basic infantry. These enemies essentially differ based on their level of armor. And also maybe some AI competency? I don't know. Some of them seem like they're smarter, but other ones seem just as stupid, so I can't really tell. Then there's the special mercenaries, which filter in and out of combat depending on the objective. There's sergeants, shark troopers, which are extremely effective in combat, recon soldiers who run up to you and attempt to stab you, snipers who do exactly what the name implies, shield soldiers, which I despise because I'm bad at fighting them, and tank soldiers, which I didn't even know existed. And of course, there are the warlords, which are commanders that you can fight for extra rewards, but can only be fought if you acquire a warlord key from a mercenary stronghold. These enemies will present a dungeon for players to work through before they can attempt to defeat the boss. It's a tactics-based encounter rather than a bullet spongy zombie one. And for what it's worth, these guys work well on paper, actually. The first boss, Legacy, gives players many different avenues of combat with how they choose to approach him. You can slowly stalk the base and take out the different sentries and guards standing nearby, or go in guns blazing and drive right up to the door to skip the encounter with the attack helicopter. And once you're inside, you're faced with many DMZ threats, including ambush rooms, flash grenades, trophy systems, tripwire bombs, that one heatwave device from BO4 which slows you down. These guys go all out, and it forces you to come up with some creative solutions and take risks to take them down. But at the end of the day, the mercs are as easy to take down as being able to get a line of sight on them for about 3 seconds. For completing the Warlord, you gain access to a special weapon blueprint, but only for the current game, which sucks, and it doesn't help that if you have the firepower to take down a Warlord, you probably won't even need to use any of these weapons that they drop, especially with the 1 hour time limit. In execution, the amount of work and strategy it takes to take down a Warlord simply isn't worth the reward. Heck, you don't even get a Wonder Weapon, at launch, for defeating him. And besides the story mission, and the simple achievement of saying that you've done it, there's really not much more of a reason to come back to these guys and reattempt it, which is a real shame, and also, I know it's just a me thing, but these guys aren't exactly fun to fight, unlike a zombies boss fight. Due to the mercenary nature of the encounter, they have extremely low health pools, and they deal high damage back. So the entire encounter is as difficult as it takes to actually enter the room and see who fires the bullets first. And sure, that's realistic, but it's why zombies better fits making its bosses monsters with mythology and sci-fi bending attacks. You can get away with a better balance of combat, because the guy with a gun is nothing more than a guy with a gun at the end of the day who is surprisingly more effective than a dark ether god who summons lightning, but can only basically shatter you down to your armor if you're wearing any armor. And of course, this doesn't change with any of the preceding warlords, who are just as susceptible to a bullet to the head as the next guy. The mercs are a good proof of concept, and as popcorn enemies, they work well with the undead horde. In the game story missions, you actually have encounters with both undead and terminus outcome mercenaries, with a three-way fight that actually takes advantage of the merc and undead AI as the two groups attempt to focus on you and each other. And it's where they work the best, but as their own enemies, I'd rather just fight the undead, and that seems to be true for most players who avoid the mercenaries if they can. Now let's talk about the story missions I've been referring to. In a first for the series, MWZ introduces story-based missions that you can tackle to gain access to major act missions which grant you a unique level encounter using the systems of MWZ and a cutscene which advances the narrative in parts. The quests include tackling specific enemies, completing certain objectives, using pack-a-punch weapons, defeating mini-bosses such as the Stormcaller and the Aetherstorm, or defeating the aforementioned Legacy, and so much more. What's even cooler is that you get rewarded for doing this! What? Rewards for my time in my zombies game? Say it ain't so! Sure, some of these rewards are just simply stickers, calling cards, and emblems, but some of them are schematics like the aforementioned Quick Arrive schematic and the Wonder Off, and for completing all the main story missions, you even get a zombies exclusive character skin. Wow! Again! A reward for playing the game! Say it isn't so! Now, in all seriousness, despite this being a major advancement for the series, and it already being done in World War II Zombies, this is just the bare minimum, and we have a long way to go before rewards actually feel worth it for your time and effort. But something like this needs to make a return. Sure, some of the challenges are annoying, but to unlock the mode's unique boss fight, you'll need to interact with just about everything Operation Deadbolt has to offer. Getting just about any player of any skill level ready for anything. 
and I think that, that whole process is super neat. No tutorials involved, simply a challenge that presents to you an obstacle that you'll inevitably need to overcome, like fighting a Mega Abomination, and also fighting other warlords like Legacy, and infiltrating high-level infected strongholds. But did some of these challenges have to be something like killing 20 mercs with Energy Mine? Because that challenge sucks. Each of these missions is helmed and narrated by different characters, so let's meet our new cast, and let me tell you, there are some real duds in here. First of all, there's your Exfil Operator Amy Fang. No Raptor 1, I'll tell you that. Then there's Hugo Barrera, otherwise known as Stanley557, our boy Soap from the campaign. All I know is he dies, so canonically MWZ takes place before the events of MW3. Crystal Miller, who by golly exist. Lucas Dobbs, who by golly exist. Rupadir Kapoor, who by golly exist. And Selma Green, who is played by Deborah Wilson, who plays Seer in Jedi Fallen Order. And finally, there's Ava Jansen, the mode's protagonist, main character. She's something, but she's essentially the main driving force behind the main narrative and is pivotal in stopping Zakaev. Ava is an Ethereum physicist who is recruited by Zakaev under the guise of using Ethereum to create clean renewable energy. Soon realizing in the horrors that she was aiding and creating, Ava reached out to Deadbolt in the hopes of being rescued. This is where the first act mission takes place, with players being tasked with infiltrating the facility and escorting Jansen to safety. The second act mission has players infiltrating a Terminus Outcomes Combine and deploying an Ethereum Neutralizer prototype. And the third mission takes place with neutralizing Zakaev's Ethereum compound, capturing the man himself, and deploying the finished Ethereum Neutralizer prototype in the hopes of cleansing Urzik Stan from the undead. Each of these missions have players combine both undead and mercenary enemies, with each mission segmented between an undead portion, a mercenary portion, and a mix between the two, testing your skills against both threats and how they bounce off one another. There are some really cool tricks here too, like in the third act mission, Terminus has set up small shipping containers full of undead, ready to pop open should you get too close to their compound. And each mission always starts with a high stakes intro purely for spectacle, it always gets me hyped and gives the attack a sense of gravitas, particularly involving a similar effect produced by the campaign. And it's cool that we have an actual Warzone encounter with Terminus, something Cold War was never able to dabble in with the battle between Requiem and Omega. Again, credit where credit is due, it makes the world feel alive. Particularly engaging moments include the beginning of Act 1's mission, which involves you taking down many different routes to infiltrate the Terminus compound, the Act 2 mission, which begins with your helicopter being blown up, you can encounter a Bargoy shapeshifting as a perk machine, and the event ends with you needing to defeat a Mega Abomination while the Ethereum Neutralizer is attacked from all angles. And then there's the grand finale known as Act 3. Having shut down Zakaev's compound, players are escorted by Ravanov and Ava as they attempt to activate the Neutralizer. Right before it can go off, however, all of the commotion has caused an Ethereum Worm to attack the two groups, and thus begins the game's first boss fight, Orcus. As stated previously in my boss fights video, Orcus is a powerful boss that can instantly down players with his powerful attacks. I won't go over it too much here or you tread my thoughts, but I really enjoyed this encounter, and the buildup throughout the entirety of Act 3 is paid off in such a brilliant way and compliments the level designers for curating this area towards Orcus' attacks. I think the only downside, however, is that in order to access it, you'll need to complete 20 to 30 hours of story missions, which can vary in difficulty based on player skill and the bugs you encounter. These missions integrate campaign, spec ops, and zombies mechanics beautifully. Maybe a zombies campaign can't work, but a zombies map that features campaign elements and scenarios seems to be the way to go, and MWZ more than proves that. But for completing each of these missions, you're rewarded with cutscenes that slowly push the narrative forward. The first act ends with Ava being taken into custody before being recruited to aid the team in stopping Zakaev. The second act concludes with the team collaborating on how best to use the neutralizer against Zakaev's second vial of enriched Ethereum, which if used could cause another countrywide outbreak. How Weaver and their others got their hands on this stuff is unclear. The third and final act mission takes place in the Orcus boss fight. In just the nick of time, Ava activates the Neutralizer, killing the Worm and neutralizing Zakaev's second Ethereum vial. With it, no more rich Ethereum can be created, thus preventing any further war zones from happening. 
In the ensuing chaos, however, a dark ether tear is temporarily opened, and Ava is met by a demonic entity calling to her, before being released from the dark ether's hold, and the tear is closed. Apparently, Zakayev escapes off screen, and further content is teased as the game's initial content comes to a close. These act missions aren't perfect. To even access them, you have to go through a grindy, repetitive process that attempts to validate the hour long gameplay sessions especially at launch when you could only complete one challenge per game in the later acts. But I think that this is a step in the right direction for the series, and I would love to see a dedicated challenge and reward narrative system reintroduced into later entries in the franchise, because I'm gonna be honest guys, daily challenges don't exactly cut it for me. I love how these missions guide you through essentially everything that the game has to offer, and I have to agree with the notion that it gave me a reason to continue to return to the game. I felt rewarded for my efforts, and even for a casual player, you can complete these missions over a long period of time should you choose to stop and smell the roses. This is something I've always wanted in Zombies, and the game greatly benefits from its inclusion. And the story cutscenes are a nice reward as well. You're not rewarded for completing an insane quest that requires a Raffle Waffles guide, but for playing the game and its main objectives. The game wants you to get engaged in the narrative and world, and by making the story readily available through gameplay, you're already off to a much better start than anything that came before it. Now, the quality of the narrative is a whole other story. Characters come off as flat, motivations feel unearned or unexplored, and unlike Cold War, there's hardly any mystery or questions that need to be answered. I don't exactly know who any of these people are, with many of them filling in the dead space with the same generic quotes that are looped each game. The only two characters worth of note that provide the story with some meat on its bones are the two that show up in the Act 3 boss fight, Ravanov and Ava Jansen. And sadly, I don't think Ravanov is all too interesting of a character to pull from, despite how much I love him. As stated in the Cold War review, Ravanov is a foil for the antagonist William Peck, a man torn between his allegiance to his homeland and doing what is right, and in Peck's case, a selfish thing, toiling with the ideas of defection and interpersonal revolution. Much of his arc is already completed by the time that we meet him in Firebase Z, and the subsequent experience seemed to reinforce his radical, yet well-meaning nature. A man driven by his strong moral compass to save the world, no matter what gets in his way. Which is commendable, and makes him a strong ally for Weaver and the gang to have. In MWZ, Ravanov feels, at worst, generic. A veteran action hero who has taken up the role of leadership based on his previous experiences and age. But that won't stop him from entering the field should he feel unnecessary. If anything, his inclusion is what binds the experience to Cold War, even if the connection is thin. But to be candid, I do think it is cool to see him and to see the writers have confidence in some of their newer characters. No Rick Toffin or Samantha Necessary, which is a bonus for me personally. Thankfully, as the narrative goes on, Ravnov's character is further explored. Or at least, it's explored through Ava. Then there's Ava, a physicist who is interwoven into the story in her pursuit to create a clean, renewable energy a young woman who deals with theoreticals and impossible pseudosciences. She is driven by her desire for research and soon ends up learning more than she bargained for. But for Season 0, she does nothing more than design and deploy the Ethereum Neutralizer. She's a stagnant character who can be fiery, but possesses little confrontation with her current team. There's no struggles or hardships, and the team at Deadbolt are united under the same cause, but no real conflict to speak of besides the mustache twirling Zakaev. Now, on a side note, I know I haven't brought it up yet, but for the first time in Zombies since Exo Zombies, every single cutscene in this game is a pre-rendered cutscene. Actually, no, wait, World War II had pre-rendered cutscenes. Besides World War II and Exo Zombies, we haven't had pre-rendered cutscenes in a Treyarch game. No half and half like BO3, where you have pre-rendered in and engine cutscenes, no Cold War, which by golly is not aging well besides the D Machine intro, and no slideshows like Vanguard or the ending of BO4. The visuals look gorgeous, even if the direction could use some variety. And the same compliments go for the actual graphical fidelity as well. But by god, the writing and dialogue direction of these cutscenes makes me feel like I'm going insane. Why does everyone sound like a robot mimicking human speech? Is everyone an alternate? It baffles me. Like, listen to the way that Ava is speaking here. But that was raw, unprocessed Ethereum. The material in Zakayev's vial is highly enriched. My projections show this weapons-grade Ethereum can withstand our prototype. In other words, you failed. This was a waste of time and resources. Not true. The principle has been proven. 
We just need to amplify the neutralizer and recalibrate its output. And you can do that, can you? Not quite. But Zakayev obtained research written by the expert on Ethereum enrichment. Am I crazy? I just don't believe a normal human would speak like this. This has a lot less to do with the actress, as I think she's giving a great performance with the material that she's given. It's just more the way that the scene is directed and has to do with the scene needing to be short due to how expensive these cutscenes must be, especially if they're utilizing mocap and CG. But let's see, we've covered the main narrative, the gameplay loop, the characters, the story mission, the map layout, and zones, and difficulty. Okay, making progress. Okay, we'll start off easy and continue on with the gameplay, with the game's primary main mechanics. So let's start out with the perks. Taking all the pieces from Vanguard and Cold War, MWZ has completely given up and created a streamlined perk system that is simply the one from ExoZombies. You have no perk slots, no out-of-game upgrades, and no in-game upgrades either. Each perk costs a flat rate of 2,000 points, and besides Mule Kick, every single perk is carried over directly from Cold War. These perks are not as broken as the Tier 5 abilities from Cold War, but not as weak as their Tier 1 variants either. They're just about as powerful as they were in previous entries without any additional modifiers. So Jug, you don't just get an extra 50 HP, you get the extra 100, and that's it. Which means we do lose the additional damage modifiers provided by Deadshot, damage reduction towards your armor from Jug, the increased slide distance from PHD, which just should have been a main feature of the perk, and so on. The perks aren't as overpowered, but to make up for this, you don't lose them if you go down. Unlike Cold War, which lets you keep only the first three that you bought, or the perk decay like in BO4, World War II, and Exos. In Operation Deadbolt, you now only lose your perks if you bleed out, which in some cases is a game over anyway. This change was most likely done because MWZ is an incredibly aggressive mode, and by allowing down players to keep their perks, they're incentivized to keep playing and progressing, removing the needless down cycle that makes the games so punishing. And as the series has embraced an action-adventure arcade thriller, the loss of all your perks has always felt like an outdated mechanic carried over from when the game was a resource management survival horror. And it also helps that the matches are only an hour long, so it's not like you'll be holding onto these perks for long anyways. Perks are just as useful as ever, and each of them has been curated to fill a different and distinct role. And while it's sad we didn't get any new ones, I'm personally always on the side of them just refining the system that works rather than go gung-ho and create 15 new ones that overlap with one another like Black Ops 4. It's why Cold War, we saw the introduction of only one new perk and four returning ones. Each perk was curated to fill a different and unique role, and MWZ reinforces this system with its selection, and the lack of mule kick makes sense considering that the game wants you to only load in with no more than two weapons, forcing you to make considerate choices while traversing through the experience. Honestly, as much as I don't like mule kick, this would have been the one game where it would have been pretty useful. Speaking of loadout, let's talk about the tools players can utilize to conquer the beast and all the obstacles that they will face. First, there's your weaponry. Just like Cold War and Vanguard, Operation Deadbolt allows you to load in with any weapon you choose, with the weapon starting at the lowest damage tier. This is called your insured slot. When you first start out, you'll only have one slot unlocked, and just like DMZ, if you fail to expel and are killed, you'll lose access to that weapon and a cooldown timer will start. This can be lowered by playing subsequent games or simply waiting. Also carried over from DMZ is the Weapon Acquisition System. Should you exfil with a weapon you looted from the battlefield, you'll be able to select it as a part of your loadout. This also applies to weapons given to you by friends. Exfilling with these weapons allows you to permanently unlock them in both Zombies and Multiplayer. To be candid, this system is at most a nothing burger for me, as I'm not obsessed with the 80 different weapons that this game has to offer. And I'll pretty much play with the same one over and over again, as if that's not evident by the footage. So gunplay and overall consistency of the weaponry in MWZ will be a topic seldom spoken about because there are way too many weapons to go over, so I'll only ever be bringing up highlights like the RGL for example. As you complete Acts 1 and 2, you'll earn additional insured weapon slots, but you'll never really need more than the second one. And if you happen to have all three on cooldown due to dying, just log off for the day. It's not your time. Then there's the equipment, which includes lethals and tacticals. For tacticals, there's stun grenades, smoke grenades, scatter mines, decoys, shock sticks, and stims, and experimental gas. Over half of these are useless in a game mode as aggressive as this, with decoys sticking out for being way quicker to use than monkeys, and the experimental gas, which is useful for the dead wire detonators, and also being good on Greylorn, but that's about it. So let's see, for lethals, you have frag grenades, claymore, throwing knives, thermite, proximity mines, drill charges, sticky grenades, and molotov. And if I forgot anything else, there's like over 50 of these things. None of them really matter at the end of the day, unlike Cold War. Just like Tacticals, over half these feel like loot fodder that provide you with no real advantage in the late game, with Thermite only being useful as it deals fire damage to manglers, which they are weak to. 
Then there's the score streaks, which are once again ripped directly from multiplayer, with no zombies unique score streaks being accessible. Included are the Cluster Mine, the Mortar Strike, the Sentry Turret, the Precision Air Strike, and the Juggernaut Suit. Each of these score streaks provides you with a different ability to take down the undead, but if we're being honest here, the best one is easily the Juggernaut Suit, due to it being a high-powered ability that you can apply to your character, whereas the Precision Air Strike is literally anything but precise. Just like everything else in this game, you'll encounter these in reward risk constantly. The game encourages you to use them, but their ineffectiveness is almost comical at times, especially the Mortar Strike, which deals damage to you if you aren't careful. This is a far cry from the abilities in Cold War, and while I understand the thought process due to the size of MWZ like the use of the Precision Airstrike, the selection doesn't feel properly curated. A War Machine would have been perfect in this mode, but I guess that's what the RGL is for. And finally, for Loadout, you have Specialist abilities returning from Cold War and Vanguard. Just like the perks, these abilities do not come with any overpowered bonuses present in Cold War and Vanguard. The powers include Energy Mine, Frost Blast, Frenzy Guard, Tesla Storm, Healing Aura, and Aether Shroud. They're serviceable for the role that they fulfill, and at best are another tool for the player to use, rather than an all-encompassing powerful ability that will wipe the battlefield. Also, the fact that there's no Ring of Fire for balancing purposes makes me sad. That's still, like, the best ability! The field upgrades have also been nerfed into Oblivion, and just like the perks, receive no in- or out-of-game upgrades, making them useful in the case that best fits you and your situation the best. Frost Blast and Energy Mine are good for kills, Healing Aura if you're playing it in co-op, Frenzy Guard and Tesla Storm for support, and Aether Shroud to get you out of a pinch. I wish that they had increasing levels or abilities, because without them, they feel like that they're another forgettable tool in the player's arsenal, besides maybe Healing Aura, which is called upon every single time someone goes down. It's also a good way to revive teammates without risking death in high intensity situations. Hopefully the augment system in BO6 remedies this. Then there's whatever is in the various buy stations from around the map. Finally stripped of the salvage system, the buy station is another feature ripped directly from DMZ and Warzone that allows you to trade in your points for self revives, gas masks, armor pouches, rucksacks, and casmere grenades. Each of these items is pretty self explanatory, with the gas mask being used to protect yourself from gas inside of spore zones and also inside the Aether Storm. Gas masks can also be refilled by simply interacting with an ammo box. These devices also instantly refill your ammo and non wonder weapon grenades for free, with a 60 second cooldown. I'm not the biggest fan of the buy station system. It's simply another investment to make with your points on top of the 30,000 required for one max pop weapon, 18,000 for perks, 5,000 for self revives, 20k for max armor and rucksack, and 4k for a gas mask. Now granted, these factors can be mitigated by armor, rucksack, and gas mask, and your self revive carrying over in between games, and you can even find most of these items like aether crystals inside of reward risks for completing contracts and side objectives like a mercenary stronghold, always granting you a three-piece armor vest. And of course, there's a schematic system that allows you to load in with items like the Aether Tool. But unlike Warzone, the buy station is another purchase which puts stress on the map's economy. Now, I do think Salvage was a step in the right direction to purchase items like score streaks, armor, and weapon upgrades in Cold War and Vanguard, because without it, the point economy is completely screwed up. And it makes sense why for the longest time around the game's launch, people would simply perform point glitches in order to respawn in with 100,000 points, as every system in the game simply costs that much. Points. And none of this takes into account points required to hit the box or purchase additional equipment like Casimir's. All this again loops back around to the game's only being an hour long, and by the time that you feel confident in your setup, you can't really take advantage of every tool that the game wants you to use without schematics, which is intentional by design. With the mode in each of its various systems all feeding into this one hour loop where permanent progression is made slowly, so it's easy to see why so many people are turned off from this game in the long run. At least, I think most people are. The grind is long and tedious, and the reward for your time is another game where you spend a good portion of said time getting back to where you were last game, which increases per game as schematics are on a cooldown with each use. So let's say you craft a Wonderwaff schematic to take with you into the game. Congratulations! You can now no longer create a Wonderwaff for 48 hours. And once you complete a game of MWZ, after one hour, the Wonderwaff is taken from your inventory and you no longer have access to this tool unless someone gives you one. You have to stumble upon one, or you wait. This creates a constant diminishing return on investments if you're trying to play multiple high tier sessions in one day. Now of course you have to balance the schematic feature. I totally get it. What's the point of difficulty if you can spawn in with a tier 3 ray gun every match? But it doesn't properly gel with the gameplay and the constant load in, load out nature, especially once you start attempting Aether Rifts later in the seasons. 
And to complete these rifts, it's best advised you have access to premium tools like the Aether Blade and Gold Armor Plates. So you craft these items, complete the rift, but let's say you want to try it again. Well, it's going to be much more difficult because you can only craft these items once every 48 hours. And these are items that do not naturally spawn on the main map either. So you either need to reattempt this content with less resources or hope a buddy has one in his back pocket. But in MWZ, the hour long timer balances the absurdity of the schematic system. Again, all of these moving parts and systems that excuse one another, creating solutions to problems that create other problems. Rant aside, it makes me wonder why these two features are so contradictory at the higher and more dedicated levels of play, because the game wants you to keep playing, it really does, but the schematics only being usable in one game at a time gives me the impression that they want you to play for an hour, then come back in two days when the schematic cooldowns are complete, and that just doesn't sound fun because it's not replayable in that case. It's waiting and coming back once you have the resources to try again. And before we close out, let's talk about the Wonder Weapons. The Ray Gun is okay, but when the game launched, it needed a serious damage buff. The same goes for the Unique Scorcher, which is a Wonder Weapon that propels you into the air, allowing for easier traversal on the map, and produces a high-powered charge laser beam that kills any undead that walk into it. For over half the game's lifespan, this weapon was practically worthless besides its flying capabilities. But now I'd say it's pretty okay, and the Ray Gun is actually fun to use and pretty decent against the Mercs too, which I will give it some credit for as a really good niche for taking out the Merc bosses. And finally, for the launch, we have the aforementioned Wonderwaff, which is identical to its Vanguard counterpart. Each of these weapons works fine in Zone 1 and 2, but lack the firepower or speed to deal with enemies in Tier 3, the place you'd hope they'd be the most effective. So sadly, these tools are extremely underwhelming in a game where they'd be the most fun to come across. Each and every single one of these tools make up the gameplay options of MWZ, and you are fully incentivized to find each of these items on the battlefield and figure out their best use case on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, providing players with a high amount of in-game customization, giving you plenty of tools to take down the undead masses. While I believe MWZ stumbles as a finished product, I find it hard to deny that when the action is high and you're constantly completing contracts with friends and you're slowly building up your character to the end-game content, it's actually a lot of fun. You're constantly presented with new ways to kill the undead, and the enemies you fight are properly curated and spaced out in a way that makes progression feel natural, and that is something I want to applaud. The mode is a ton of fun when each of its 90 separate factors come together in the right way, but easily falls apart at even the slightest hiccup. Alright, now that we've covered nearly every primary mechanic and their use case in this game mode, you can see why this is so difficult to review. Despite its simplicity, MWZ is a fairly complex game when you actually look at all the mechanics and how they bounce off of one of each other in the game's natural framework. So let's rapid fire some things that I either forgot or didn't know where to put them. The fast travel portals suck, and to use them properly, you'll need to learn 18 different codes and where they take you to use them correctly. There are random loot caches that are canisters hidden in the ground, which I think is really cool. The shield mercs, as I learned from John Rizzo, have a bottomless clip and can continually fire at you, on top of the fact that they're shield mercs and they're annoying to kill. There are two additional modes of transportation, the Dark Aether Tear, which works like it did in Outbreak, and the Zip Lines, which can be used for easy access around the map, which is cool. I love the blocky design of Tier 3, especially the town, which has an almost dungeon crawler-like feel to it. You're forced to think on your feet, and the hectic, chaotic nature of the zone makes for a good time. If you throw a grenade into a Mega Abomination's mouth, it instantly blows off their head. This also applies with Thermite. Every special enemy has a weakness to an alternate ammo type, Mangler's Napalm Burst, Disciples Kilowatt, Hellhound's Cryo Freeze, Bargwa's Brain Rot, and Mega Abomination's Napalm Burst and Brain Rot. It's cool to see this feature carried over from Cold War, and to an extent, Chaos's Catalyst. The vehicles around the map are extremely useful for traversal, but will need to be refilled if you use them for too long. Tires can also be popped and repaired as well. The system is kind of redundant because the second that they pop, you can just get out and instantly refill another tire, but what do I know? The game also features a unique ride vehicle, the Bloodburner, a dark ether entity turned bike that can produce a shockwave if enough undead are run over. This bike is extremely hard to control, and due to the nature of how the world is built, it isn't all that effective as it gets stuck on every rock, tree, and prefab you can think of. But it's cool they even included a unique one, I suppose. Then there's the rest of the vehicles, which are fine. A movement system that best benefits you driving on the main roads, but isn't as satisfying as they hoped it would be, but at least that's me. Of course, how could I totally not forget the friendly AI dog that you can summon? Undead will randomly drop flesh, and this can be donated to a nearby doghouse in each zone of the game to summon a friendly hellhound, with the hellhound getting stronger the deeper into the outbreak zone that you are. 
with tier 3 Hellhounds even having the ability to revive players if they go down. I personally never got to use this mechanic because either I would just never pick up the flesh chunks or I can never find the doghouse, but it's a cool feature that's nice that's there. There are a few story radios hidden around the map, telling small narratives about the named characters in this mode, but most of them either end up being nothing burgers or don't provide enough information for them to be game changing, and they're scattered all around this massive play space. Even coming across one of them is impressive enough. Actually getting a chance to listen to them and connect a cohesive story is damn near impossible without just a video online. Then there's the named radio operators, which exist, and for the ones that are actually interesting like Ava and Ravanov, not enough is done with them to be interesting as of now. The loading screen cutscenes are really cool and reminded me of the Black Ops 1 TVs. They're cool vignettes of the battlefield and create a mood that hasn't been captured in nearly a decade. Orcus and the subsequent worm fights are really cool, and it was recently revealed how the developers created these enemies and the unique challenges that they faced when developing them compared to Orda from Cold War's Outbreak. Then there's all the useless junk that you can find in supply stashes ripped directly from DMZ, but without a barter system, so they are completely useless besides selling them at the store. Of course, there's the mystery box, but I never found a use for it as the attachments are randomized, and unlike Cold War, you can't set them up to your liking mid-game, so you have weapons that simply aren't optimized, making your Lotto weapon way more important than ever, especially when you take into consideration the aftermarket parts. Then there's also the turrets and the turret circuits that you can find. These are turrets scattered around the entire map, and if you insert a turret circuit into them, these become super powerful, near wonder weapon tier abilities and weaponry that can be used against the undead. Simply load in a turret circuit and watch as it decimates even Mega Abominations in seconds. These were really useful at launch in Tier 3 when it was difficult to get your hands on legendary Aether tools and Tier 3 crystals, as it was a great way to cheese many of the game's stronger enemies, like Mega Abominations. And finally, there's this one feature I haven't talked about. The bugs. When MWZ launched, the game came out in an extremely buggy state. Enemies like the Disciples could get stuck in the terrain, you could only complete one story mission at a time, Mercs did way too much damage, which isn't a bug, but it should be. If you go down while in the air and fall to the ground, you will immediately die and cannot be revived, forcing you to go into a spectator mode for the rest of the game. Sometimes you just won't load into the map, the act missions won't load and you'll be booted back to the main menu, but the biggest ones were the ones that affected the extraction system. A looter and extraction shooter is only as fun as the stability of the extraction portion where you actually get to reap the rewards that you earned. And let me tell you, it was a complete nightmare. Every week something about it would be broken. Try to exfil? Well, sometimes the helicopter would never come. Actually make it to the exfil? Oh, I'm sorry, the game crashed and you lost everything. Try again? Oh, well this time the plane deloads without you and you're invincible and you're unable to leave. Spawn in and crash in the first minute? Well, now you've lost everything you've loaded in with and you have to reset your character. This process killed much of the initial hype for MWZ, despite community excitement for the mode. But unlike BO4, MWZ had the unique distinction of progression being tied to successful exfils, and it cannot be understated how much this hurt player enjoyment. These glitches will later be patched, but just like BO4, not forgotten especially when the glitches and crashes destroyed a major portion of the gameplay of MWZ. This is only scratching the surface of what could go wrong with this game around its launch, but for the sake of brevity, this is the last thing that you'd expect to be broken, and it truly left a sour taste in players' mouths despite the mode's ridiculous popularity with players. That's right, it was reported a month after launch that Modern Warfare 3's Zombies mode, despite the many hiccups that it had, was regarded as the best third mode the franchise had had in over a decade. Now it's unclear what this metric means and how it truly stacks up to other entries in the Zombies franchise, Extinction, Spec Ops, and DMZ, but its success was undeniable. And coming off a of preseason, it seemed to be that MWZ had created a fantastic foundation for itself. Now looking back, nearly a year almost out from my day one review, I did ask the question, was MWZ worth it for $70? And even now, I think no. I believe MWZ should have either been free to play or $20 to own separately. But as a part of MW3's package, it doesn't exactly live up to its value despite my opinions on it slightly changing. But with all of these systems coming together, let's see what MWZ has to offer and come to the questioning realization during the DLC season, of what happened here? Up an energy spike in the red zone. Never seen anything like it. <laughs> well, 
Looks like this shit show just keeps getting better and better. Everyone RTB! Looks like this off isn't gonna be over anytime soon. Bang, grab enough. Ready for evac. Guard copy. Stand by, ETA two minutes. the release of Season 1 on December 6, 2023, MWZ came out of the gate swinging just a month after the game's launch. Included were things people were asking for. New wonder weapons, new content curated for zombies, and not just a revamped Warzone map, raid boss fights, schematics, and a quest-like hunt to unlock more content. I'll start by saying that while I'm mixed on the gameplay of MWZ, I have to applaud the effort made by the developers for committing to their world and including features that cohesively mix into the gameplay properly. Many of the changes that came in Season 1 feel like decisions that enhance and shake up the gameplay while addressing criticisms and shortcomings that the game had at launch, mainly with Tier 3, with the constant need to stop and kill super sprinters chasing you and needing to constantly replay to survive. So let's start off our review of Season 1 with Greylorm, COD Zombie's first raid boss. Now I talked about this creature en masse in my best boss fights video, but I'll try and keep the discussion of the boss itself brief and talk about the raid concept instead. Spawning in various locations around the map, players must scour the world of Operation Deadbolt alongside other players and collect four USBs, which are indicated to players in four buildings around the map in these very specific corners that show you where they are, or if you know all the locations, you can just go hunt them all down like I do. Collecting the USBs can be easily done by communicating with players in the game and squatting up with your friends as well. Once all four USBs are collected, you must find the arena by locating two ammo boxes placed next to each other in one of the four spots around the map. Once found, you must wait until the storm consumes the arena and charges Ethereum seismic generators. Once completed, the USBs must be entered into the devices. And with that, the Greylorm fight begins! Greylorm sports many of the same attacks from the Orcus boss fight at the end of Act 3. It can fire lethal laser beams, spawn hordes of heavy enemies, eat players and spit them out to deal lethal fall damage, slam down on players, and summon wasp-like orbs to deal consistent damage. This is also stacked on top of the worm's giant health bar, its weak points have been made smaller to make the fight more difficult, and the storm constantly dealing damage to you if you forget to fix your gas mask or it breaks. There's a lot to juggle in this encounter, and just like any good boss fight like Mephistopheles, Greylorm challenges the player without being outright unfair, especially in a co-op scenario. The first time you do it, you might not even win, though that's what makes Greylorm so special, with its difficulty actually testing player skill and forcing them to retry if they want to get the coveted schematics it harbors. Unlike most zombies encounters and the act missions in MWZ, Greylorm can be taken on by every player in the game. This creates an amazing sense of camaraderie unseen by the series. It also helps that the boss is constantly rebalanced by players entering the fight. Once more than three players are actively attacking the boss, Mega Abominations join the fray, making the fight even more hectic. And due to the wide range of attacks and the area of effect, Greylorm isn't easily distracted by one entity. And despite your numbers, you still need to be mindful of all the other factors happening around you. Greylorm rivals many of the series' previous boss fights and the leaps and bounds it makes cannot be understated. I would love to see this concept reattempted, because sadly, Greylorm is the only encounter like this in the entire game, despite them hitting it out of the park on their first go. Included in defeating Greylorm is the added benefit of the schematics, with the rewards from Greylorm being the game's most powerful, including a flawless Ethereum Crystal, Legendary Aether Tool, and Scorcher Schematic. What's even cooler is that each of these schematics are rewarded at random to players, allowing you and your teammates to share among one another should you end up getting a repeat. And with more players, the more chances at being able to share uncollected schematics, further incentivizing teamwork. All around, it's an amazing boss fight, and being rewarded is a great incentive for players to go give it a go, unlike many other main quests which offer you an achievement and sometimes nothing more for replayability's sake. But moving on from Greylorm, let's talk about the other major pieces of content. 
Also included with this update is a new story mission. Coming off of the preseason, Deadbolt has been tasked with entering a rift that has been spotted in Urzikstan. Diving into the rift, players have to investigate a mysterious signal. They then soon become trapped in the rift, and to escape they must locate four obelisks and run away with their lives. These story missions are meant to get you acquainted with the rift that you've entered, giving players a natural progression for taking on the game's more difficult content. There's the story rift, then there's the normal rift which can be unlocked through a small side quest, and then the hard rift which is only open using Elder Sigils. Once you fill up all four obelisks, you can make your escape before being stopped by a second ethereum worm, Gormgant. Just like the rift itself, Gormgant is meant to get players prepared for fighting Greylorm, with smaller weak points, a more aggressive boss AI, increased health, and more sporadic attacks from its Orcus counterpart at the end of Act 3. Defeating Gormgant is as easy as learning the attack patterns and honing your skills. What further backs up this design philosophy is the small amount of zombies that they spawn in, putting you in a near isolated scenario with the worm. Being the next step up to Greylorm, who takes all these mechanics and attacks and cranks them up to 11. Although I could do without these stupid annoying purple orbs constantly flying about. I hate you. Once defeated, the beast explodes into a rainstorm of blood. And also, once defeated, has the chance to drop players a wonder weapon case, and a locked diary, which is used to access additional content. Once you escape, you are presented with a beautiful cutscene of Ava caught in the middle of an undead outbreak, as the voices of an unknown entity are speaking to her. Ava is then quickly surrounded by the undead heads of Requiem, and she attempts to hold her own before being thrown out of her delusion, where it is revealed that she has been attacking fellow members of Deadbolt including Ravanov, who is killed on the spot trying to stop her. As she is arrested, it is revealed that Ava is in another delusion before being thrown out of it by Ravanov calling for her on the walkie-talkie, explaining what's happening in the Act 4 mission. Most of this is never resolved, and sadly the cutscene is simply filler that hint at the entity being Samantha Maxis. Overall, the Bat Signal mission is easy to run through, and is a great first step to getting players acquainted with the El Bargua Rift. Which I might add, this area is also one of the best in the entire game. Just like the Tier 3 zone, the close quarters and chaotic nature of the castle is a blast to play through, and the entire building is so intricately built, featuring a ton of different ways to get around. There's an underground section, towers, and zip lines everywhere that lead to additional parkour challenges, with these sections offering players rewards in later versions of the map. So let's talk about those rifts now. Once players have completed the Bad Signal mission, they'll be rewarded with a diary. To unlock the Aether Rift, players must now hunt down three additional items and upgrade the entire set to make sacrifices to open a large rift gate located outside of Tier 3. This is the closest the game has to an Easter Egg Hunt, and with a guide, this can be completed in about a single game. Honestly, I don't know how people even figure any of this stuff out. Like, you have to throw a Molotov and a piece of zombie flesh into a doghouse, and you'll receive a part for the ritual. Or if you shoot an infected stronghold spore with a brain rot weapon, it can be interacted with to unlock an additional item. This stuff is weird. Once all three items are retrieved, you must then upgrade them by entering fast travel portals around the map in accordance with your item. Once the three remaining items are upgraded, you can now place all four items into the altar by the portal, and take down a small horde of the undead, including a mega abomination. Once defeated, you are rewarded with a Sigil, which can then be used to access a Normal Mode Rift. Inside of the Normal Aether Rift, players must now return to the respective story mission map and complete three unique contracts that must be acquired by hunting down three Mr. Peak's bunnies. Once a contract is completed, you will have a chance to be rewarded with a Rift exclusive item. In the Season 1 Rift, you will have the chance to retrieve a Dog Bone, an Aether Blade, and a Gold Armor Plate. The Dog Bone spawns in the aforementioned Allied Hellhound that can revive players, the Aether Blade is a Hell's Retriever lethal equipment that instantly kills three normal undead with a short cooldown, and the Gold Armor Plate refills the player's armor over time. These schematics are invaluable, and just like Greylorm, these items are some of the best that the game has to offer. The schematic can be earned in the hard mode version of a respective Rift, using an Elder Sigil, which can be obtained by completing contracts in the normal Rift. In the hard mode Rift, more Mega Abominations begin to spawn in, the time to complete the Rift is cut in half, 
and you'll be rewarded with schematics as you complete contracts. In the first Aether Rift, these schematics are guaranteed as you complete contracts, but in turn this is easily one of the most difficult rifts to complete. At least not until later, that is. I love the rift system, especially if you go in with a coordinated team. Contracts are not easy to complete, and it takes teamwork in order to make it out alive. The system invokes some of the best moments of Extinction's gameplay while continuing to be its own thing. The enemy AI is cracked up to 12, especially in the hard mode rift, but if you utilize the items that you've earned in the normal mode rift, you'll even the playing field. Even when you're coordinated, there's just enough time to complete all three contracts if you do everything properly. And that level of tension makes the map exhilarating. Included in the rift is also a slew of side easter eggs by locating keys around the corners of the map. You can use these keys to access additional power-ups and a wonder weapon case. This was the best way to accumulate VR 11s before Season 2. My issue with the rift is the obscured map which makes it difficult to locate ammo boxes and the lack of a buy station, pack, and wonder fizz, if they're even on the map. I've never seen them. The only way to keep the items that you obtained is by exfilling and avoiding the storm, which shrinks and centralizes on the group as time goes on, forcing you all to stay together, especially towards the end. I do have a few complaints though, despite my incredible praise. I do wish that the contracts were more unique. You spend quite a lot of time on the normal Earth's Extend map, and completing contracts is the game's primary bread and butter. So it's weird we're essentially repeating the same contracts just with a more difficult AI and higher enemy numbers. For example, the only contract that has changed is the Aether Extractors, which go from being attacked by Merc enemies to simply undead, which is cool and honestly fits the contract much better. But the Escort is a difficult Escort, and the Outlast is just a difficult Outlast. Some creativity would have gone a long way. And then there's the Rift itself. I know, I just praised how difficult and well designed the arena is, but at the end of the day, it is still a reused location from other pieces of COD media. And with the recent release of the final Aether Rift, it's not hard to compare the unique quality in their final outing to the more copy-paste style of the previous rifts. And then there's the AI density. This isn't much of an issue in the first rift, but it gets so comically bad as the game goes on, it isn't even funny. The game just starts throwing in hordes and hordes and hordes of enemies and special enemies, and at some point, you just gotta say, what are we doing here, guys? And that's season one of the game. Coming just four weeks after launch, this content came at just the right time when the game was beginning to become stale and it shook up the gameplay just enough to keep players engaged and further develop its fanbase. And due to the co-op nature of the game mode, it's always fun to recruit other players and aid them in unlocking and completing the Aether Rift as long as beating Greylorm. But that's Season 1. Nothing was exactly changed about the map, but due to its size, I can't exactly see how they'd be able to do that in the time that they've been given. But a man can hope, I suppose. Overall, Greylorm is the best part of the update. For me personally, that is. And the Aether Rift is a lot of fun, although a tad grindy, due to needing to complete three separate games to gain full access to everything, including a run through the story mission, opening the Rift, completing the normal Rift, and then the hard mode Rift. Then there's the world of the Rift itself. Just like the main map, the Aether Rift reuses assets from Warzone with Albargua. Personally, this is a new map to me, so I don't exactly mind, but I completely understand the mindset that this is a bit of a letdown especially because we rarely get to visit the Dark Aether, and when we do, especially this time around, it isn't even a unique location. But I appreciate the effort into making this place at least try and feel unique regardless. And for as much as I like, that's pretty much it! And this is the most content any of the seasons would get! Looking at the zombies portion of the season roadmap, it becomes more and more depressing to be a fan of the undead. This makes sense, as none of us want resources being pulled away from Black Ops 6. But if you're going to go and make the effort to create Modern Warfare Zombies, you might as well hire more developers to go all in on the concept. And sadly, we're getting their best, but there's so little to talk about. And it didn't help that there were rumors that Treyarch had already been taken off the project, which began to worry fans. But hopefully, by Season 1 Reloaded, our fears would be washed away. Season 1 Reloaded came with a bunch of bug fixes and a new Warlord. That's it. Dockaby can be encountered in the skyscrapers in the Zaravin city. To balance how the Warlords work, the developers decided only one should be on the map at any time, and they rotate on a game-by-game -game basis. I think that this is a tad strange, because having a Warlord at each corner of the map would actually be a really cool idea, and could allow players to continue to fight the Warlords if someone defeats them. Because honestly, the rewards aren't even that good if one person goes around the entire map and does all four of them. Like, what's the point? I think this is a tad strange, because having a Warlord at each corner of the map would actually be a really cool idea, and could allow players to continue to fight the Warlords if someone defeats them. 
because once someone does defeat them, no one else can do anything about the Warlords the rest of the match. But to each their own, I suppose. Regardless, with all the gear players can accumulate by Season 1 alone, Dockaby is a complete pushover. Same goes for Legacy if you approach him with a gold armor plate and an Aether Blade. And it also doesn't help that you can simply scale the wall by her and raid her compound immediately. And that's it. Overall, Season 1 is a ton of fun, but it won't convince you otherwise if you're already on the fence about MWZ. But I applaud the commitment to bringing more content to the people who actually like the game mode, unlike Vanguard, which goes back on its philosophy halfway through the year. Having a raid boss fight works perfectly for this game mode, and the Aether Rifts are a natural step up in gameplay that demand a bit more teamwork between players. The schematics are some of the best that we've received, and the content itself is overall well polished and thought out. Opening the Rift feels closer to an actual Easter egg, and the Rifts themselves, while linear, require players to use a unique level of skill that combines perfectly with the gameplay mechanics presented to the player without being completely overwhelming, unlike some later content. Although no signs of Zakaev is a disappointment. What's the point in resurrecting this geezer out of a Misso silo and letting him get away if he's going to do nothing? Then there's the Warlord, who exists, but sadly it's not as interesting of an encounter as Legacy, or even better yet, an undead enemy. The game ends off Season 1 on a low note, but leaves an unforgettable impact. Let's see where it goes next. I think I'll start off the breakdown of Season 2 with the roadmap. These are released every season, so players can see what content to expect during the respective season. With the game splitting seasons between a season launch and a reloaded event, with the reloaded events bringing additional content for players to return to. With there being about 11 seasons and 6 themes, Zombies was sure to get some content during Season 2. And you know what theme they wanted to go with for Season 2 and Season 2 Reloaded? Wow! A Zombies themed season! Last time we got one of those was during Black Ops 4. We got two of the most unique multiplayer maps to date, a whole new Blackout game mode, and arguably the game's coolest, and the Victus crew being brought to the game, and the release of Alpha Omega. And whoa, in Modern Warfare 3, we're getting a Walking Dead crossover, a battle pass themed around undead skins, and new Warzone multiplayer modes. Wow, let's see what Zombies is getting! Zombies started off this season with literally zero content to its name, with everything coming in the Reloaded event about a month later with it being reported around the time that Treyarch had already been taken off the development of this game mode, with work on Black Ops 6 taking full priority. So here we are at a crossroads. On one hand, I'm happy Treyarch is putting their full efforts into Black Ops 6. The mode looks fantastic, and it's clear all of their hard work has paid off. On the other hand, we've all been swindled by a snake oil salesman who wanted to sell us Zombies players Modern Warfare 3 because if there wasn't Zombies, the likelihood that we would buy it is much lower. Unlucky, or I guess lucky for Activision, Treyarch and subsequently their open world development team made a strikingly fun mode that has issues that seek to justify themselves, but one quite popular with a casual demographic. I mean, look at a YouTube channel like Donuts, who has seen firsthand the unique audience that this mode has garnered, with many of them having never picked up a normal game of round based zombies before. So we have this extremely fun, albeit contentious and mixed game mode, and all of a sudden the rug is pulled out from under us. So for the preceding two seasons, the game would release with the rest of the content Treyarch had planned being finished by Sledgehammer and High Moon Studios, with their own original content coming in seasons 4 and 5, with of course a direct plan and oversight by Treyarch to ensure that the narratives line up. So for season 2, we have nothing, but that must mean the developers are cooking with season 2 Reloaded with all that extra time, right? Season 2 Reloaded came with an additional Aether Rift, Warlord, and schematics. We'll start off with the Warlord first since the rest of the content is tied to the Rift. Kears is a gas-centric warlord who hides in the mist and attempts to defeat players with the power of stealth. This warlord is quite annoying to fight, with the best strategy being running inside and hoping that you kill them before anything goes wrong, which isn't exactly all that fun, and they're constantly moving, and they're very tanky, and the gas will instantly kill you, but it's good that there is a schematic to actually help you with this. So let's talk about it. In the new story riff, players must follow the most filler plotline ever, where 
Ravanov and Deadbolt follow Jack Fletcher and his crew into the Dark Ether. You know, Jack Fletcher. That guy who teams up with Zakayev? Did you already forget about him? Well, guess what? This is the last time he ever shows up, so... This is where his story apexes. Where him and his team have been trapped and need Ravanov's help to escape the Dark Ether. And this escort takes forever. And after traveling through the Dark Ether and escorting the team in what feels like 40 years lost in the wilderness, Fletcher escapes, leaving Ravanov and Deadbolt for dead. Bolt. Couldn't have done it without your help, Deadbolt. Sorry to disappoint, but, uh... We then fight an HVT EMP Super Mangler, who goes down in about 30 seconds, collect a golden item that can be used to open the next rift, and immediately escape. Honestly, nothing of note happens in this story mission, and if I'm being frank with you all real quick, I literally didn't even remember what the story mission cutscene was, uh, in case you want to know how significant this whole section is. Okay, after rewatching it, let's recap. Ava aids Ravanov in healing a wound he sustained while she drills him for answers about Requiem and who he really is. This whole scenario ends in a whole lot of nothing, besides Ravanov implying he knows who Ava's real parents are, while she storms off in a hurry to investigate more answers. This whole segment feels like nothing more than filler, and I sadly can't tell what is achieved here besides a lead into another cutscene where we find out some more answers. So far, Soap no longer shows up, Green has essentially been excommunicated with, and none of the other colorful characters who fill your roster even get so much as a word in. The world of MWZ has become so much smaller, with the main cast at this point being Ravanov, Ava, and the upcoming entity. With characters like Fletcher, Green, Soap, Barrera, and Zakayev never showing up again. Like, I know some of these guys aren't able to even be the most interesting characters in the game, but their inclusion goes a long way to establishing stakes and the world and makes the battles between Deadbolt and Terminus feel like an ongoing conflict. This is something that they really wanted to dabble with in Cold War between Requiem and Omega, but simply couldn't due to time constraints. And it seems like the exact same thing is true here. For example, in the intel, we get a radio from Zakayev, who is still angry at Captain Price for throwing him down a missile silo. I mean, who wouldn't? He plans on taking revenge and wants to use killing Soap as a means to achieve his goal. But guess what? After Season 3, these two characters no longer exist in the concurrent narrative with them never even being given a chance to interact, unlike Weaver and Kravchenko in Cold War, who feel like much more developed characters. Like, the most back and forth that Soap and Zakai have even get to do, I think might be in one of the random story missions, and not like the story act missions, but one of the actual in-game mission boards where they have a whole bunch of unique quest dialogue. But I don't remember them actually interacting with each other, or at any point in the story, and in the Act 3 mission, Soap doesn't even get to see Zakai have escaped. You just get a word from him saying that he's gone and he's never seen again. What's the point of that character? I really want to know if they had any plans for him. So imagine my pleasure to find your protege, Soap McTavish, embedded with Operation Deadbolt. Oh. <laughs> oh, losing him, that would be like losing a brother. Oh, yeah, the thought of it is, uh, exhilarating. Duh, Captain Price. I will show you what loss is. After all, I learned from the past. Then there's the Dark Aether Rift. To unlock it, players need to complete trials while within the Story Rift and collect three purple items. To upgrade the remaining items, players will then need to go to the firing range and shoot targets, go to the graveyard and collect kills with alternate ammo types, and punch some bags in the boxing gym. Once all of the items are collected and upgraded, take them to the rift and defeat an HVT Super EMP Bargua, and you'll have access to the second rift. Not a terrible process, but again, I'm genuinely shocked how quickly people find this stuff. Sure, the tasks aren't hard, but with how large the map is and how specific some of these challenges are, I'm surprised people are even able to complete them as quickly as they are. And finally, the Rift. Players will fly around the map and collect an Outlast contract, an HVT contract, and an Aether Extractor contract, with the HVT elimination replacing the Escort contract from Season 1. This is my favorite Rift to complete personally, and the challenges are fun to play through, if not infinitely easier than last time, mainly just the exclusion of the Escort. But to compensate for this, the schematics are not guaranteed, and if players want to obtain the Bloodburner keys, the VR11 schematic, and the Mags of Holding, they'll need to re-enter the rift over and over again. 
This is helped by having additional teammates, but thankfully due to simplicity, this is the one rift I'm okay with having randomized schematics for, especially because the schematics are pretty good overall. The mags of holding, while just being the gobblegum stock option, is surprisingly pretty helpful, especially with how many special enemies the game likes to throw at you, which, oh boy, does begin to become a problem after this. The VR-11 schematic, which is useful for the Greylorm refight, doing escort contracts in the Dark Aether, and dealing high power damage to special enemies. And finally, there's the Bloodburner keys, which spawns in the zombie's unique vehicle, the Bloodburner, at the player's convenience, instead of happening upon one in the wild. This thing still sucks, but it is cool, I suppose. Also included in the update, completely separate from the rift that I totally didn't forget to bring up, would be the containment level system. Ripped directly from DMZ, the containment level system promotes continued survival in long play sessions, with players increasing their containment levels as they complete contracts in the corresponding zone. So your containment level rises by 1 if you complete a tier 1 contract, 2 in tier 2, and 3 in tier 3. When you exfil, a total number of points is added up and you'll receive bonuses as you progress through levels 1 to 1000. Many of these are quality of life bonuses that make the experience more fun and less grindy which I can appreciate as many of these bonuses address criticisms that I've had with the gameplay loop, despite not entirely fixing them either. Bonuses include increased starting essence, perk price reduction by 33%, increased contract payout by 33%, decreased pap cost by 20%, decreased mystery box cost, and starting with 5 armor plates, in no particular order. This system goes a long way, but funny enough when the game launched, if you entered the Dark Aether, none of your progress would carry forward with you. And because 75% of the content in one of these MWZ updates is surrounded by the Dark Aether, it didn't help things, and for quite a while, I just never got a chance to use the system. One day, they'll release something with zero bugs. And it doesn't help that once you go over 100, no matter how high your exfil streak is, if you die once, it'll jump anywhere below 100, with you losing your exfil streak, even if you crash. So despite what the system brought to the table, it was hardly used by players, and it wouldn't receive an update and fix until around Season 3. And that's all of the content that could be played in Season 2, a far cry from the content we received in Season 1, despite being quite similar. The Aether Rift itself is fun, but the story mission isn't. It also provides us with no interesting story plot points, and overall, it feels as though it's dragging out its narrative longer than it should be. The Warlord Cures is terrible, and some of the schematics are helpful for later, but definitely not right now. And Season 2, or more specifically, Season 2 Reloaded, is an incredibly small content drop for the world of Modern Warfare Zombies, especially in a season all about the undead. It's quite embarrassing for all parties involved. Let's pray Season 3 is able to course correct things before it's too late. Oh, Eva. Your parents would be. They are. Oh, they are so very proud of you. I'll cut to the chase. Season 3 for MWZ is the exact same as Season 2. We got a new Warlord, a new Story Mission, a new Dark Aether Rift, and new schematics to be earned. And all of it is in a reloaded portion, so again when the season launches, Zombies players have nothing to actually do. So once you complete the Elder Aether Rift in Season 2 Reloaded, you now have to wait a full season to do anything else that's new. And I cannot exaggerate how little I played the game when there was no new content to complete because I've already completed everything else for the first three act missions, and there's no reason to kit out your character and to hold on to any additional items, because there's only 10 stash slots in the main menu, which is a major problem with the game, because now you have so little room to hold additional items that you collect or create with the schematic system, especially now that we have over 10 special schematics which take two days to recharge, so you'd want to make as many as possible to stockpile them, because, you know, the game gives you less and less stuff as you go on unless you wait. Again. It's all designed this way, and it's really weird. Let me go off script for a second here. So you have all these different systems. You have the schematic system and the cooldown system, 
And around season two and three, you only had 10 stash slots and everything took two days to recharge. So you have all these really cool items and you're trying to stockpile them because when the new season comes out, you want to do all the content, but you can only, if you don't stockpile the items, then you don't have an ability to keep going into the content because again, it takes two days to recharge stuff. So either you create stuff beforehand, so you have extras and then you have stuff that you can create the day of, or you can only create one use of a gold armor plate the day of, and then congratulations, unless someone else gives you a gold armor plate, you're waiting two days. I understand why it's designed this way, but I think a lot of it tries to excuse itself as we mentioned earlier in the review, and by the time we got to season three, the system was really starting to show its cracks. Anyways, let's start off with the final warlord, Rainmaker. Sectioned off on the bottom right of the map is the compound, which includes mortar strikes, attack choppers, and waves of reinforcements. Once inside the mansion, you have to avoid trip mines, cluster mines, sentry turrets, and so on. Unlike Legacy, Rainmaker runs around the arena much like Dockaby and Kears, and attempts to leave behind explosives to kill the player, but if you catch him off guard, they'll go down in seconds. By this point, you'll also earn a random wonder weapon whenever you kill a Warlord, which can range from the ever so useful Scorcher or VR-11 to a Raygun or a Wonderwath, which isn't as useful. And that was the last Warlord and subsequent content that is based around the AI enemies known as Terminus Outcomes. I think the concept does have a place in Zombies. It's certainly a nice change of pace, that's for sure. And I think the way that it's implemented in MWZ, rather than in a round-based experience, works really well because so many of the opportunities with Terminus Outcomes are completely optional. And I would love to see it reintroduced somewhere down the line, especially if in BO6, the Requiem crew have to battle Richtofen and parts of actual Requiem at some point. But a greater balance of combat needs to be struck in order for the combat to feel fair and satisfying, and MWZ almost got this right, but especially around launch, it was incredibly imbalanced. The Warlords vary in difficulty and complexity, and Rainmaker and Legacy strike a good fun balance between difficult siege-based combat with engaging dungeon crawling that gives you many different ways to approach the problem which is an aspect from DMZ I would love to see lifted in subsequent open world entries. Especially the sequences in the first three act missions where we fight undead and merc AI, which makes for some really cool set pieces. While some of the special variety of mercs can be annoying, especially the shield merc, there's a large enough variety of them to counter every scenario, even if at the end of the day, they all go down as quick as the undead sometimes. While some of the special variety of mercs can be annoying, especially the shield merc, there's a large enough variety of them to counter every scenario, even if at the end of the day, they go down as quick as the undead sometimes. Although, some tweaks I'd like to see apply to the mercs in the future. Get rid of the shield merc, or at least his unlimited weapon clip. Allow pack weapons and alternate ammo types to do unique things to them. Allow wonder weapons to have cool effects, like the scorcher vaporizing them, or the wonder Wolf turning them to ash like the undead in Liberty Falls intro cutscene. Give them strategic movement and more encounters like ambushes can be cool if done right. Dungeon crawling fits this enemy type the best, and each warlord should be on the map at all times to give different groups multiple opportunities to fight one. Because at the end of the day, every single warlord is easily killed and countered with an RGL grenade launcher. And then there's the third Dark Aether Rift. While investigating answers to her past, Ava is lured by the entity into the Dark Aether Rift, where it is now up to Deadbolt and Ravenov to rescue her. Inside the rift, you must destroy crystals, fill up soul boxes, and defeat an upgraded disciple who becomes temporarily invisible while it summons additional bosses the player will need to defeat. Once killed, Ava is released from the entity's hold before it consumes her, and the crew escape before more can go wrong. In the end cutscene, Ava is shown a video recording by Ravenoff of Dr. Grey, a woman that Ava has had a massive obsession with and her research with Requiem, and sadly nearly all of it got her killed, and Ravenoff believes that she deserves some answers. In the recording, Grey explains to Ava that she is a surrogate mother to Ava, who was born with the added DNA of Samantha Maxis and Ravenov, and that her connection to the Dark Aether could either prove invaluable to their research against the Dark Aether, or catastrophic. Ravenov was assigned to oversee and protect Ava, and Grey's exposure to Ethereum during the outbreaks is slowly killing her. At least it's implied. Ava expresses sympathy for Grey, but cannot say the same for Ravenov, who believed hiding this information was the best way to protect her with Ava storming off, abruptly ending the conversation between the two. Finally, nearly four seasons in, we have some concrete answers for how these characters and the events of the story all connect with one another. And if you ask me, it's not even worth it. My biggest issue with the MWZ storyline is the shift in narrative from an ongoing outbreak begun by a legacy character to a hijacked adventure by a new protagonist, Ava Jansen, and her quest for knowledge on who she really is and how to defeat the entity 
a creature only brought to light at the end of Act 3. But regardless, I don't think this narrative would work anyways if you just roped in Zakaev somehow, because then it'd just be a repeat of Cold War with Kravchenko, Weaver, and Zykov. I adore Ravanov's inclusion in the narrative, and he gets a ton to do and work with, but his inclusion being completely wrapped around Ava makes him dependent on her development rather than his own. With his seldom thoughts of the disappearance of Sam and the deaths of the Requiem crew never being touched upon, despite that being a goldmine for narrative opportunities. But with only one story rift left, things will have to conclude one way or another. Then there's the Dark Aether Rift itself. Once you stop the entity, you'll be rewarded with a gold item. This time to unlock the Aether Rift, you'll need to kill a sergeant with a hellhound, kill 50 undead in the Aether Storm, and then follow footprints in the mansion in the bottom of the map. The footprints can be seen with death perception, but apparently I'm a cheater and just guessed it and it worked. To upgrade the items, you'll now need to interact with three triangle soul boxes around the tier 3 zone of the game by offering one of the purple items. This can only be accomplished by one squad per triangle per game, so that's kind of annoying. Once completed, you'll have upgraded and collected all four items and will be able to enter the new Aether Rift. By the way, I love the way these rifts appear, and the glass-like sound effects and the textures as the rift open, and it's a really nice touch how a horde of enemies spills out of them when they're first opened by the ritual. But this is the same repetitive process as last time, with little to no variation in how the overall setup works. You get an item from the story mission, you hunt down three more items, whether it be in the rift or in the open world, you then go around the open world and you upgrade the items, it's all kind of the same thing, four times. And also, it would be especially boring trying to catch up on these rifts as there's a lot of added work that needs to be done if you didn't do them as they came out. But as an added bonus, those triangle soul boxes referenced earlier can be redone each match. When completed, they offer you a guaranteed Flawless Aether Crystal and Legendary Aether Tool. And seeing as it takes three days for Flawless Aether Crystal schematics to be recharged, this was a perfect way to stockpile them. Then there's the rift itself. Getting tired of hearing this yet? This rift features additional items that players can attach to their person, overall on top of the schematic system. These items grant you different abilities as the horde density has only gotten larger with this rift. As you complete an Escort, Outlast, and HVT contracts, you'll gain items that slow enemies as they get close to you, force specific enemies to drop nukes, and headshots to cause AoE damage that kills more undead with each shot. And let me tell you, this rift does not hold back. There are enemies everywhere, and even with the extra abilities, your horde clearing potential can only be so strong, making items like the Gersh device more important than ever due to their infinite horde killing potential. The rift itself is okay, but 100% suited for Scorcher Traversal due to the flat lay of the land. The contracts themselves aren't difficult, but the Escort takes 6 minutes and will consume a good portion of your time in the Elder Sigil, so don't slow down. Grapple Guns from Blackout would have translated perfectly into this map as well. Also, for some reason, this is the only rift where you can't drop Jug Suits, and I think that's dumb. But in addition to the Aether Rift, there's an additional secret boss. Much like Greylorm, players can take on Ganaxi by completing all three contracts and breaking spores in the nearby arena from smallest to biggest. This fight plays identical to the Story Rift version, but with more health, stronger special enemies, and larger hordes at its disposal. The fight is cool, but would be completely unfair without the additional abilities you earn throughout the Rift, so it's cool that they're included for players to use. This boss also features an additional chance at a schematic once defeated which I think is really cool and a great way to add additional challenge to the rift while still offering players rewards should they seek it out. And just like the last rift, these schematics are not guaranteed to players, so what wacky new schematics can players earn? First off, there's Deadwire Detonators. This item allows explosives to stun enemies in wide groups with a Deadwire ability. This schematic is situational at best and is purely suited for crowd control if you use the RGL grenade launcher, but definitely not worth the time it takes to go for. At least I think so. I know there's a ton of great strategies that you can use with experimental gas and molotovs and thermite, but I never got the best use out of it. The item is best used in the Unstable Rift, which we'll get to in the next part. Then there's the Sergeant's Beret, which makes you temporarily invisible to merc enemies and summons an allied merc, much like the friendly Hellhound. This item just kind of sucks. The merc is okay, kind of like an AI version of Ravanov and Jansen that show up in Acts 3 and 4, and also if you attack a single merc, your disguise is instantly broken, which I don't think is very fun. And finally, there's the Gold Mask Filter, which refills your gas mask over time, unless it is fully broken. This schematic is completely useless outside of fighting the Warlord Kears, because interacting with an ammo cache instantly refills your gas mask anyways. So basically, it's a waste of an item slot, and you'll probably never get any use out of it, unless you're fighting Kears. This was a problem I foresaw in Season 1, with how overpowered and universally useful the schematics were. The Gold Armor Plate should be taken into any piece of content that you do, 
The Flawless Crystal saves you so much setup time, and Legendary Aether Tool is complete RNG to get in the normal map, so giving you a way to create one every day is invaluable, especially when the jump of damage from Purple Pap 3 to Orange Pap 3 goes from 24 times to 32 times the damage. So once you run out of schematics like that to give to the players, it makes sense preceding schematics would involve more niche aspects like the gas mask abilities, friendly allies, and unlimited magazine fire. It doesn't help no other wonder weapons were released past the VR-11, which again, this is the second Outbreak mode where including more wonder weapons would be perfect for this mode. First you have Outbreak, which has never updated to include the Cerberus or Crystal Axe, then you have MWZ, which features two legacy wonder weapons, the Scorcher, and the completely revamped VR-11. MWZ and Outbreak were the perfect opportunities to bring back legacy content that didn't work in the past, and it's crazy how the VR-11 was able to squeak its way in, and its inclusion is cool nonetheless, especially because it becomes the de facto high damage wonder weapon that deals massive damage to enemies like Raylorm randomly, but we'll save the rest of that conversation for the conclusion. The third Aether Rift is a marketable improvement from the previous one in some aspects and a downgrade in others. It offers a more compelling story mission that actually answers questions and propels the narrative forward. The Rift itself is fun and gives players new tools to mess around with as well. The new boss is also a fun addition and gives you additional chances to earn schematics. On the downside, the schematics range from terrible to situational at best, and the horde density begins to grow out of control with this rift, and this carries over to the last two seasons of content as well. Season 3 offers just about the same amount of content as seasons 1 and 2, but hopefully with three seasons left we can finish off on a high note. You need to let me help you. Help me? All you've done is lie. Wait, wait, wait. But Ava! Season 4 is where any sort of appreciation one could have for this game goes completely out the window. Actually, that's not true. You know me, there's always good things to find, but this season makes it much harder than any other in the entire franchise. As always, let's take a look at the season roadmap. Wow, it's a single block that's coming in season. And I, for one, am so excited. So we jump all the way to Season 4 Reloaded and we're presented with the Unstable Rift. MWZ's answer... I think, to the lack of a round-based zombies mode and the schematic cooldown system, with at this point so many of the schematics taking two days just to recharge. So if you want to recharge them quicker, you can enter the rift and immediately clear your cooldowns upon completion. But first, how does one enter the unstable rift? Well thankfully, this is really easy. Once 10 minutes into the match have gone by, obelisks will begin to appear in over 30 locations across the entire map. To fill up an obelisk, you'll need to use the respective alternate ammo type mod. Once three have been filled, a random Red Dark Aether Tear will appear across the map. It's random whether or not it'll appear close to you, for as there are over 20 spawn locations for the portal. But the best part is, anyone can enter the portal. So essentially, you can do all of the work, and another group can randomly take it from you. How does that make any sense? Why doesn't the portal appear only for your team? Why not let everyone take it and it never disappears so everyone has a chance to do it? Why punish players who actually attempt to enter the rift? Why not spawn the portal next to the player who completes the third obelisk? Why would you alert every player on the map when only one group so far has done the actual work to enter it? The entire system is asinine and goes completely against the co-op nature of the game mode. Why am I forced to share and compete for rewards that I put in the effort for? None of this makes any sense. Now granted, I try to review everything in Zombies with an unbiased point of view, and I understand the logic behind the decision making, and I never want to be rude as at the end of the day, these developers do put a lot of hard work and passion into their jobs. But the Unstable Rift is easily the greatest piece of mismanaged content in the entire franchise. Did they playtest the entry method? Was the thought process that this should be difficult to enter because of the valuable reward of schematic cooldowns? Because that seems so backwards. You balance your content by making it competitive? That makes no sense. If you're afraid of the system breaking the game, then why not only reduce the cooldowns by 50%? Why not make the entry method more difficult than just a scavenger hunt around the map for three random obelisks with over 50 spawn locations that basically require a scorcher to easily locate? And all of this fuss, and we haven't even entered the rift. 
Once inside, players are teleported to the Albargua Castle Center, where they are locked in by an Aether Storm and forced to survive. The Unstable Rift gives players 45 minutes to defeat five large waves of the undead. When all the players spawn in, they are given a gold armor plate, mags of holding, all the perks besides Tombstone, and max pop weapons. Any additional abilities, players will need to bring in themselves like Deadwire Detonators. This is another section of the game where it cranks the undead density to 11, and the best way to complete it is by using the RGL Grenade Launcher with Deadwire Detonators, as no other weapon is able to deal with crowd control in the same way that the RGL is. Enemies also possess Tier 4 health, and simply spawn in two big numbers to efficiently deal with with most standard weaponry. Like, this is what the best strategy looks like. And honestly, the rift itself isn't even that fun. There's no buy stations to spend your points on, and it's simply doing this for 45 minutes. After a certain amount of time has passed, a boss will appear capping off the wave. So if you have a Scorcher, you can simply fly back and forth throughout the arena until the boss spawns, which isn't exactly good game design if you ask me. And that's all there is to it. The rift isn't exactly all too fun and just battling undead until the timer decides it's time for a boss. This rift is poorly designed and feels like a massive waste of time. Wave 1's boss is an HVT Bargwa, and now during Wave 2, Bargwas will spawn in. Wave 2's boss is an HVT Mangler, and now during Wave 3, Bargwas and Manglers will spawn in. Wave 3's boss is a Stormcaller, and during Wave 4, Bargwas, Manglers, and Disciples will spawn in. Wave 4's boss is the HVT EMP Bargwa from Seasons 2's Rift, and during Wave 5, you'll encounter HVT Bargwas, Manglers, Regular Bargwas, Normal Manglers, and Disciples. And finally, Wave 5's boss is the HVT Disciple from the Season 3 story mission, which can become invulnerable as it summons additional HVT enemies. Oh, and it can also self-heal itself. And somewhere in there, it's also added Hellhounds and Wetchlings to the fray as well. This entire scenario is a complete and utter mess, and enemy health scales to absurd levels. I legitimately can't see how you can beat this without major crowd control like the RGL Grenade Launcher with Deadwire Detonators. Thankfully, multiple precision airstrikes will do the job against the HVT Super Disciple. Oh, and in between each wave, players are given a small loop pool to keep them going. In these rifts, you get coveted items like a cluster mine, an alternate ammo type, a single self arrive. Wow, really feeling the love here, guys, huh? Hey, didn't we just get all of these really cool items to balance the large horde size in the Season 3 rift, like the ice foot that slows down nearby enemies? Why weren't those items in the rift? It would have perfectly balanced the mode, especially if you introduced new ones as well. Maybe even ones for players to actually keep like schematics as they progress. It seems like a completely missed opportunity, and it doesn't help that the entire rift takes place in a single location, as, well, with no change in the storm's location, nothing else is there to do besides kill undead. Which, I mean, yeah, it's fun to kill undead, but it's just 45 minutes of this. This mode was marketed as a risk versus reward challenge that offered players a round-based experience, and the Unstable Rift is only those things by pure conjecture. But in the end, the Rift becomes an unplayable challenge that throws players through the ringer under the guise of difficulty. It'd be just as difficult if I was constantly kicked in the balls while playing, that doesn't make it fun. And that's all the content that came with Season 4 and Season 4 Reloaded. It's a real shame because I feel like you could do something interesting with the Unstable Rift concept. I love when the game throws high numbers of special enemies at you. Heck, my favorite step in Origins, way back when, was when you fought 8 Panzers, because no other event in Zombies had done anything like that. But this is not it, and a few runs through the balance machine would have gone a long way, because difficulty should be fun and challenging, not tedious. And that's the Unstable Rift. Without sounding pedantic, this mode exemplifies the worst aspects of MWZ. It's long, grindy, and forces you to compete with your fellow players for even a chance to complete it. Well, around this time, it was announced Season 5 would be the final major content drop for MWZ. So let's hope the extra time was worth it.
And here we are, the final main season of MWZ. It has been a very, very downhill roller coaster since season one. So let's see if they managed to pick it back up at the last possible second. Just like the seasons before it, all of the content for MWZ is coming in Season 5 Reloaded, so we'll just skip right to that. Season 5 Reloaded comes with a final story rift, three new schematics, and a couple of other neat secrets, so let's hop right into it. The final story mission sees Ravanov and Ava preparing to confront the Entity, with it being learned that if they can defeat the Entity, then that will sever Urzikstan's connection to the Dark Aether, and the outbreak will be stopped. Ava opens a Dark Aether tear that the Deadball Operators can jump through, and together they all prepare to confront the Entity. The final Dark Aether Rift is an absolute marvel, and the closest we've gotten to a unique zombie-specific outbreak zone that takes advantage of the wild dimension that makes up the Dark Aether. Players will bounce between islands to get further into the zone, with red crystals producing additional bounce pads as you make your way towards objectives. Players are tasked with cleansing obelisk and filling various soul boxes. As this happens, parts of the Dark Aether zone become active, boats become platforms, trains can take you higher up the tower, and more undead begin to fill in the space. This is easily one of my favorite zones in the entire game, and it almost knocks Season 1's Rift out of the park. And the kinetic gameplay is an absolute far cry from the misery that was the Unstable Rift. It's almost enough to make me forget about it entirely. Almost. Once you make your way to the tower, you must now go through a parkour event that takes you further into the sky. What's cool is that if you accidentally fall off the tower, there will be green portals that act as checkpoints, which is really cool and takes full advantage of the flight system of the game, while also adding unique vertical gameplay. Wow, it's almost like someone who plays video games actually designed this! This is a big moment for the franchise. Once atop, you'll be teleported to a flying cargo ship, where there will be one final teleporter that takes you to the Entity's boss arena, high into the sky. I might add, while the mode is designed around it, the Scorcher is invaluable on this rift. It's insane how much it can help you. From here, you, Ava, and Ravenop can finally confront the Entity, and this fight is a vast improvement from the Forsaken and the Archon. The Entity features two phases, and in Phase 1 she'll charge a purple beam that sweeps across the arena, and summon bolts of lightning across all of the islands that will instantly down players without armor. To defeat her, you'll need to destroy the orbs that surround her body, with each orb destruction doing a little bit of damage to her, with great damage being applied if you destroy all the orbs and force her to move. The fight has a great momentum, and bouncing between the islands is super satisfying. And the enemies being Tier 2 enemies makes them perfect roadblocks, but not overly tanky, which is the exact action movie health that the undead should have in these scenarios. It's something I didn't really talk about, but I think tier 2 zombies are perfectly balanced, and especially with how orange tier path through weapons work in these act missions. This health is just perfect enough to let a lot of players use different weapon variety and different weapon skill caps, but also if you have the highest amount of damage, it feels like a complete action movie, and the devs do a really good job balancing this in the Act 4 Rift. There are so many zombies, but due to how weak that they are, it feels like a lot of fun to actually kill them and blast through the hordes. It's super exhilarating. Once defeated, the Entity will return for Phase 2, where players must now charge Ava in the same way that they did Samantha in Forsaken to defeat her. Once done, players can now shoot at the orbs on her hips, chest, head, and hands. Defeating all the orbs will deal major damage. I love the way that this phase plays. It's super kinetic, which is a word I'm going to keep using because it's the word I'm using right now when writing all these scripts, and I keep thinking about it. And being able to safely strafe the lasers while you murder undead is done perfectly. Also, the lasers have an extremely graceful hitbox, and it helps that if you're beamed out of the sky in midair, the game doesn't immediately kill you and render you unplayable, unlike some glitches at launch. While I've had my issues with MWZ, the final story mission is amazing, and it's easily the bar the game should have shot for. It's simply a shame it happens at the last minute, but hey, I guess finish strong above anything else. Once the entity is defeated, seriously, this animation is dope as hell, you can make your way back to the center and retrieve a Mr. Peaks doll used to open the final rift, and you can exfil to obtain the final cutscene.
hear her anymore. My mind is so quiet. We can celebrate back at Deadbolt HQ. This place is starting to unravel. Our bridge is gone. I can feel the Dark Ether starting to peel back from our dimension. We have to go now. Three months after the outbreak has been stopped, Ravenov calls up Ava to see how she's doing, where we learn she's vacationing while investigating the town of Liberty Falls. All of a sudden, she is lured into a mirror by a mysterious figure. Ava believes it's the call of Samantha, as Ravenov urges her to run away. Ava is pulled in and is whisked away from sight into the dark ether. And now, with the upcoming release of Liberty Falls in Black Ops 6, it's only a matter of time until I believe we learn what's happening here. The outro cutscene for MWZ is both a cool mysterious lead into the next game that gets people excited and holds its cards close to its chest, but also one that doesn't give us any actual resolution to the outbreak in Urzik's Dan besides a single line by Ava before the cutscene even plays. No answers as to how Ravenov is still fighting in his 70s, no resolution on Fletcher, Zakayev, and Termas' outcomes, and there's no story conclusion for Barrera, Fang, Dobbs, Kapoor, Green, or Miller. Everything just wraps up cleanly. That's it. It's an extreme letdown for what the entire year you're built up to, and it signifies how much Ava hijacks the narrative after Act 3, but I guess at the same time also how limited in scope the narrative has to be because it's very expensive to bring on all these different voice actors when at the same time you can just tell Ava's story. But it is weird that they set all of this up and none of it is used, unlike Cold War, which has complete story arcs and endings for Weaver, Grey, Carver, and Strauss. There's no satisfying conclusion for what's happening here, and just like Straub and the God King from World War II, Zakayev is traded out for the Entity, a villain with no motive besides to cause chaos and to merge with Ava, which we still don't exactly know what the ramifications of that are. Like, who is the Entity in all seriousness? We know it's Ava's Dark Aether twin sister, but how does any of that work? How does she have powers? How is she alive in the Dark Aether for so long? How does Ava have any powers at all besides being the daughter of Samantha Maxis? Is it genetic? Can Ava pass it on to her children? We don't know, and I don't know exactly if that's intentional by the writers or if they were so limited on time they just wrote it without any actual forethought, which I can see them doing. For example, the term Janus is referring to a Roman god of doorways, meant to represent gateways and is often depicted with two faces. Ava Jansen is 100% related to Project Janus, first seen in Cold War and there's no mention of it anywhere in the game, despite the revelation proving crucial as to what Richtofen exactly wants. But it's a shame to see that there's no connection so far in the narrative regarding this, whether intentional or not. Then there's Ravanov, who is so closely tied to Ava's story, he hardly gets a chance to tell his own. Which is a real shame, because Ravanov is one of the stronger original characters created for the Dark Aether narrative. And with a tease saying that the story will continue, in my opinion, Ava will 100% show up in BO6. Mark my words. Then there's a Dark Aether Rift. To unlock the final set of items, players will need to complete a biker course with a Bloodburner bike, kill an enemy with a rebounding Aetherblade kill, and then execute an AI Merc while wearing the Sergeant's Beret. Then to upgrade these items, you need to find these three 115 Meteors around the map. One requires you to flop from atop these silos and dolphin dive on the shipping container, which is harder than it looks apparently. Then you'll need to get specific elemental kills near the Opera House. And finally, you need to kill a large barrage of HVTs and high health enemies, basically just a mini unstable rift. And once you place all these items and totally not get teleported into the story rift by your allies because that totally didn't happen to me on stream. Can. Okay. Mr. Peaks. And finally, the giraffe. Okay, back up. Let's see what this does. The giraffe toy is comically small. Oh, we can just go. Oh, oh boat's successful. I didn't even Wait, have you to. Know. Wait, fellas. Oh, look at all those wedgelings. Can we actually just go? Fellas, did we initiate that or was that someone else's? I I don't know. Hey, yeah, you know what? It. It'd be really funny if we've gone to the wrong dark ether. Oh, did my game crash? Wait, sake, don't on? tell me we did. I didn't even think about that. I'm well, actually going to I'm going to lose it if we just did. Tell me we're going to Almazda. Almazra, whatever it's called.
Dan, they're all set now, Mazra. Oh, are they? I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, please, for the love of God. Yeah, oh, thank oh, God. Choo -choo train. Wait, hold on. Is this the uh, story mission, though? Uh, oh my god, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> Please. Yep, it's a mission. Yo, guys, look at NPCs. Ah! Hey, Jet, welcome to the last mission of MWZ. <laughs> Whoa, I haven't even seen the other one. Then you'll have access to the final Dark Ether Rift, which includes an Outlast contract, a Spore contract, and an escort contract, which I swear to God, I am sick of seeing this thing. While traversal is still helped by the blue jump pads, there are significantly less than the story mission has, so it's advised that you bring a scorcher if you aren't familiar with the way around. The escort features four stops, the outlast contract throws an HBT, EMP, Barg, or a Mangler into the fray halfway through, and the spore contract takes place in the sky. Just like before, you'll be randomly rewarded with schematics in the Elder Sigil, which includes a friendly disciple bottle, which summons a friendly disciple, much like the friendly Hellhound and Merc, a grenade bandolier, which automatically recharges your tactical and lethal equipment over time. Fun fact, this can be used to create infinite Gersh devices, essentially giving you 5,000 points every three minutes, and a stash increase, which increases your stash from 20 to 30 items, which is nice, but this late into the life cycle of the game, it's hardly worth it. And also, why not create a unique item? Why is it a stash increase? Just Give me the stash increase for doing something something else. That's not a schematic. That's just an item that gives you 10 more items. Like, what about all those cool items that you put in the Season 4 Rift? Just make one of those a schematic. And just like the Rift before it, the Elder Sigil features an additional boss fight that can only be encountered in the hardest Rift through a small Easter egg. By taking Spore Extractors to this Spore in the middle of the Rift, you'll be given an R4D Detector. Now you'll have to run through a nearby maze and scan Golden Arrows as you sprint through. Once completed, you earn a Gold Skull referencing Moby Dick. Now take it to a whale statue, grab the USB that it drops, insert the USB into a random computer, then defeat the HVT Mangler that spawns from it. Then take his key to the top of the central tower and unlock the service room to gain access to the Echo Entity boss fight. A super version of the Entity fight that includes more undead, stronger attacks, more health, and much less time. Thankfully, your timer is reset to 15 minutes when you enter. This fight will truly test your metal. If you don't manage to take out all of her orbs in specific phases, you might even time out. But thankfully, there is always an escape portal waiting for you, which is a really nice touch. This fight requires precision, focus, and skill, and it's one of the better boss fights throughout the entire series. Although, I could do without the 15 Bargwas launching me off the map every time I want to attack the boss. This fight is insane, and my only complaint would be how many undead and special enemies it spawns, especially in solo. Even in the main rift itself, there does not need to be this many enemies, especially because you don't have those special abilities that you earned in the Season 4 rift. Seriously guys, difficulty is not enemy spam, it's proper challenge, which most of the Echo Entity fight manages to do in spades. Honestly, it's so satisfying to destroy the orbs, especially with how powerful jug suits are on her. Like, there's even a mad lad who beat the fight with just a sniper rifle, and that has to be applauded. Defeating the Echo Entity rewards players with a unique Dark Aether inspired blueprint for the STG and an additional chance for various schematics. So grab some jug suits and run through it with some buddies. It's an unforgettable experience. And that's the final story and Dark Aether Rift. Overall, the concept was a ton of fun but what they could truly be only feels realized in its last outing. And sure, while they finish strong, there's a long road to get there, and one I don't feel many people will be returning to once the game's year is finished. So I hope that at least this video could document most of the game's content properly. The schematic system worked fine enough, but most of the time, the cooldown system and the inability to carry forward your items into preceding games felt like problems that were only solved by creating further problems. And at the end of the day, the one hour game loop severely restricted how the game allowed players to progress, forcing this awkward progression system that underpowered you with each preceding game as there were items that you could only obtain through the schematic system. This led to the creation of the Unstable Rift. But as stated previously, the entire rift itself is awful and feels like a band-aid that only creates a worse experience than the one it tries to solve. And then the rifts are fun, but repetitive, and once you've received the schematics, there's no reason to return to them besides for content creation purposes like me, or if you're doing a cool challenge. 
Now, granted, that could be said for most content in Zombies, but unlike previous experiences in Zombies, each rift requires you to bring specific setup items that you can't naturally use in-game, so once you complete them, there's rarely a reason to return, as you'll be using resources that you might need elsewhere. But I love the concept of the Echo Entity boss, and super secret boss fights 100% need to come back. But before we get to the conclusion, let's cover some talking points I forgot to mention. The triangle lockdowns brought in Season 3 were rebalanced with them now giving players a two-thirds chance to receive a Tier 2 Crystal and Epic Aether Tool, and a one-third chance to receive a Tier 3 Crystal and Legendary Aether Tool. Fun fact, if the Friendly Disciple kills the HVT Mangler that is need to open the Echo Entity boss fight, the key just never spawns. Again, there are way too many zombies and special enemy spawns in the final Aether Rift. Seriously, this is unacceptable. The Entity mentions a group of beings known as the Shadow Smiths looking for Ava. It's possible that the Shadow Smiths are beings Monty and the Shadow Man and the Keepers and Apothecans merged into. This is backed up by the shadowy figure that pulls Ava into the mirror, branding a Shadow Man-like tiny hat. Richtofen and Ravanov are stated to have been part of the outbreak during Liberty Falls, so maybe Ava will meet a younger version of her father in BO6. But that's Season 5 of MWZ. It truly brings some fun content to the table that enhances the repetitive nature of the rifts. And the schematics range from useful, but similar, to a stash increase that the game should have started with. And that's MWZ. But with this entire game covered, let's bring it all together in our conclusion. Okay, before we actually close out, I'll add the Season 6 update stuff that was just talked about in a blog post two days ago. Despite no new content coming, the developers have temporarily removed the requirement to use a sigil to enter a Dark Aether Rift, and have cut all schematic cooldowns in half for the next two seasons. This is really cool, and if you ask me, it should be permanent. Does this completely break the balance of the game? Not exactly, but it does allow for more run-throughs and patches up problems we've established earlier, and it will not be used to rate the game's conclusion, as this feature right now is only temporary and will go away. That would be like rating Cold War off of the Pumpkin event. It's really cool to see features like this, although releasing a buyable entity skin kinda sucks, and no Jansen or Ravanov operators continues to make me sad. Give this poor old man an operator already! Modern Warfare 3 Zombies is a confusing and contentious game mode. On one hand, you have a Looter Looper Extraction Shooter, a game that wants you to jump in and play in a further refined version of Outbreak's gameplay. Contracts run smoothly, and the gameplay keeps you in the action constantly, unlike Outbreak, which suffered from medium to large map sizes with plenty of inactivity in between its more kinetic moments. The map is split into easily distinct zones, and the difficulty progresses naturally, with the terrain and undead actually deterring and filtering out players a proper skill level. The extraction system is great when it actually works, and there's never a dull moment. Vehicle combat is underutilized due to the design of the map, and Scorchers reign supreme as the mode of traversal, especially when you are playing the game's Tier 3 zone. The mercs are a formidable foe that become more fun to fight as they are properly balanced, but once you do everything that there is to do with them, you'll only ever need to combat them if you want a cheap and easy way to get a 3 plate of armor. Warlords are a fun addition to the game loop and offer an experience never before seen in Zombies, but very well known in DMZ and Warzone. The weapon extraction system is pointless after the first few hours of gameplay, and having nearly 100 plus guns means few stick out and many are downright pointless, as AR-37 isn't going to offer you much of a different gameplay experience from AR-16. While rarely spoken about, various weapons and aftermarket parts help weapons stick out, although an overabundance of customization options and weapon choices can overwhelm players, especially when compared to previous experiences that utilize simplicity to their advantage. Your rucksack is a useful system, but could use a separate tab to store schematics so they aren't taking up a slot in your inventory. But maybe that risk is the point that you lose a slot of inventory to keep the schematic. The buy station is an interesting inclusion, but has little to no personality to it. I want my world to feel alive and unique to zombies, and features like this do not help, and it's sad that in BO6 that exact same buy system, just with the old crafting table where it's completely unpersonalized, is also returning. 
The mystery box, which has actual personality, is downright useless, and you're better off upgrading the gun that you load in with, which has proper attachments. In fact, despite the game promoting weapon variety, every other system is actively incentivizes you upgrading your best loadout weapon, and not enough is done to give players a good reason to try something else out, when the attachment system is so min-maxed that you can create weapons that are leagues above what the game offers. The perks, while weak, are perfectly balanced, and only losing them on bleed out is a nice touch for balancing sake for how difficult and aggressive the game is. Co-op features like being able to join squads, leave squads, and revive players, help people with contracts, and take on raid bosses is a perfect fit for an open world game mode for zombies. And the fact that this hasn't been attempted before is kind of crazy to me. Now strip away the DMZ and Warzone aesthetic, create a zombies rich world, and now you're looking at something with legs to go the distance. The overall look of MWZ is rather disappointing, and at times looks like any other FPS on the market, which isn't a good thing. If anything, the uniqueness is something that has always set zombies apart with its stylization. The special enemy variety suits the needs of the game, but I swear to god, if I see another Bargwa Mangler or Disciple, I'm going to scream, give these guys a rest already. The Mega Abomination is a super imposing enemy, but I've had my fill of them for over a year now. Good thing that they're not returning! Hellhounds can also burn in hell, and then there's the bosses. Orcus is cool, Gormgan is a step up in difficulty, Greylorm is awesome, the HVT Mangler is a pushover, the HVT Disciple is difficult but nothing enough Perseverance can't stop, the Entity is a cool ending, and the Echo Entity is such a cool fight, but we'll see how it ages since it only came out about two weeks ago at the time of me writing this, and three weeks ago at the time of me recording this. The Raygun needs a MUCH bigger splash radius, the Wonder Wolf is okay, but too slow for super sprinters, the Scorcher is the best traversal method in the game, and also once it got buffed, it got really good, and the VR-11 is an HVT's worst nightmare. Super cool to see this thing back in the spotlight on its second attempt. Hope the same is true for the Jet Gun in Liberty Falls. And while I'm at it, by the way, with the VR-11, does a lot of the same stuff that it does in the original game, shoot an allied player, makes them invincible, I think that's still what it does in this game, and if you shoot a zombie, turns them into a merc, shoot a merc, turns them into a zombie. Seems about fair. I realize I never talked about the VR-11. Most lethal and tactical equipment is useless, and all this needless garbage that you can sell at the shop is pointless and has no place in this mode. Just clutter for the sake of being ported over directly from DMZ, without any forethought, which can be used as a statement to describe nearly everything in this mode. Being able to buy infinite self-revives is needed in an experience as unbalanced as this, and replating is much too important to leave to RNG drops to keep yourself alive. There's a reason the gold armor plate is so coveted. The act missions are a ton of fun, but the method to unlock the first three takes way too long. Although I'd love to see the objective system brought back and retooled to be less grindy and more fun. I love the idea that whenever you actually complete a page of the objectives or complete one full row of them, you get a free perk. And at launch during MWZ, this is a great way to just stack yourself up and help you in terms of early game combat. Seeing mercs and undead fight in large scale battles was some of the coolest parts of the first three act missions, and this is lost once we leave preseason. The story is a massive letdown, and while it transitions into some more interesting mystery and reveals, it completely abandons its setup in favor of Ava, Ravanov, and the Entity. Sakaev is completely thrown away, and Soap does nothing too. Both characters are there for marketability, and to see them unused further proves this. They are certainly no Kravchanko and Weaver. And I can't exactly say if this was them compromising on the story, or if there was an issue with actually trying to get the actors into the studio, or if they had to downsize their narrative. I'm very unsure what the answer here is, but it's a major letdown. The world building of MWZ is hardly touched upon, and many of the new characters that it establishes, besides Ava, get no time to be developed. The themes of war and the cold, callous abandonment of life is a theme that the story has words for, but never actually touches upon in any meaningful way. The Entity is a non-villain, and its motives and connections to the bigger picture are unclear or underutilized. The thing's dead. Is it going to come back? I don't know. The mystery isn't exactly well done, and it feels drawn out because the narrative is extremely paper thin, and the relationship between Ava and Ravanov doesn't have enough cohesive tissue to comment on besides the fact that they both care for one another by the story's end. There's a hint at what's to come, and I pray it's paid off in some meaningful way. The Aether Rifts, while fun, become quite repetitive, and don't do enough to shake up the main gameplay loop besides taking the core gameplay of MWZ and cranking it up to 11. This is helped by having 6-8 to eight long week gaps between them, 
but for someone who wants to unlock them all now, there is a ton of work that needs to be done, and at the end of the day, it all plays the same, needing constant playthroughs to experience everything properly, because the game has that kind of mentality. Then there's the game loop itself. MWZ is built atop the philosophy of two steps forward, 1.9 steps back, which is something I've remarked about in my day one review of the game, and to my disappointment, this is still true with progress being made in small increments over a long period of time to keep you engaged. But this design philosophy is countered at every turn by the schematic system, the Aether Rift system, the secret fights between the super bosses like Grey Lorm and Echo Entity, with each of these events requiring you to bring your best items if you truly want to win. But due to the cooldown system, every game you enter of MWZ forces you to start out with less and less until the content does become completable in its current state, or you simply lack the necessary items to progress because gold armor plates only spawn in the first and last Dark Aether Rift as rewards, and are not possible to be earned outside of that, despite their near necessity. As much fun as I have with MWZ, these are massive flaws that cannot be understated, and the schematics seek to justify the Aether Rifts, which seek to justify your content loop, which seek to justify the timer, and when examined under a closer lens, the whole system is about to fall apart like a deck of cards. It begs the question to ask at the end, who is this game made for at times? You have casual players who will play the game once or twice a week, but will never unlock any actual late game content due to the grind, and then there's hardcore players who are forced to stop playing due to the content requiring them to use premium items that you can only make a limited amount of. For example, when I wanted to keep fighting the Echo Entity for a live stream to practice, I was thankful my chat, moderators, and friends were more than willing to drop me additional items because without them, there was simply no way for me to reattempt the content without me compromising my chances of waiting two or three more days. The fat trial system is cumbersome to use, and the unstable rift currently takes the cake as the worst designed piece of content in COD Zombies. There are worse maps and experiences, but the unstable rift just stands mighty and proud as bad decision after bad decision in lieu of a problem that the game created. And overall, Modern Warfare 3 Zombie started out and was reported by Call of Duty's general manager as the best rated third mode in a decade. And whether that report is true or not, the lack of support it received post-launch was calculated, and it should be studied, especially when you consider the post-launch content multiplayer and Warzone received. Once again, despite my mixed thoughts on it, MWZ could have only gotten better if fully supported, especially if Seasons 1 and 5 Reloaded are anything to go off of. These modes can only survive by the love and passion put into it by the developers, and despite what others might say, I know for a fact that despite its circumstances, this mode did everything it could, and its developers should be super proud of the experience that they delivered, both from Treyarch and anyone else who was working on it. Modern Warfare 3 Zombies is a mess that further improves upon the foundation left behind by Outbreak and Cold War. I would love to see this iteration come back. And just like before, MWZ should have been used as a launch pad to tweak what worked and change what didn't in future installments, and I feel I was able to cover just about everything that encapsulated my thoughts on this wacky mode that almost could. And finally, to conclude my thoughts, let's look at how I talked about the mode in my day one review. I expressed issue with who this game mode was made for, and that it wasn't worth the price of admission. And sadly, I still believe that these opinions still carry forward, all the way to the end of the game's lifespan. I truly believe if this was a free-to-play offering with no bells and whistles attached, not as many people would draw as much of an issue with it. Now, that's subjective, but the point stands that this mode is being valued at over $70, the same price as multiplayer and campaign. And for that price of admission, I don't believe that you're getting content that's worth that value, especially when stacked up to previous entries like Black Ops 3 and IW. Heck, even BO1 if you go back that far. And sure, those games total around $120 for the base price in DLC, $150 in BO3's case, but those games are absolutely worth the price of admission. They offer hours upon hours of creative undead action with ideas and concepts that all cohesively flow into one another. Replayable experiences that might be able to stand the test of time. As for MWZ, while the experience was fun, that's it. It was fun. It's a chaotic experience meant to provide content in a year without one, and while it has some enjoyable moments, even for a super fan like me, I don't think this is one of the entries I'll be returning to once this video is complete. Overall, MWZ is an interesting game mode, but one left ultimately to rot in the care of the few who try to nurture it. Whether it be by Activision Mandate, a Treyarch 1, a direction to push to finish Black Ops 6, or simply a snake oil salesman trick, we'll never know. 
But for what it's worth, Modern Warfare 3 Zombies was another shot at experimenting with the undead. This mode is a lot more versatile than folks give it credit for. Hopefully next time, it gets the support that it deserves, because despite my mixed feelings, MWZ and most of its players deserve better than this. Survived as a child. Liberty Falls is even more of a one-horse town than I suspected. Thank you all for watching, and thank you real quick to every single person that you've seen in the video who's helped me out with gameplay, who's given me items during the Echo Entity run, who has just stopped by and said hi, I appreciate the support or anyone who I've gotten a chance to play with. If you like this video, how about watching my other reviews of IW, AW, World War II, 9, Cold War, and my re-review of IW Zombies. One day we'll review everything, I promise. I still have that Extinction review to finish. But if you want even more content, I have a boss fights ranking video, a podcast I did with John Rizzo about IW Zombies, a video that predicts the perk is coming to Black Ops 6, and so much more. So if you like long form undead videos, you've come to the right place. Thank you everyone who worked on this video with me, and thank you for watching. These videos come from nothing but love for Call of Duty Zombies, and I hope to continue to share that love till the day I die. So hey, why not subscribe? But with all that said, thank you for watching. And remember, Keep on slaying.